It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Ferrat, Mary Jo Foley are here. Actually, they're together in Manhattan at CUNY. Wow, they're going to do the show uh, to, next to each other for a change. That'll be fun. Uh, we're going to talk about turning your Android phone into a Microsoft phone. We have to because it's the end of the line for the Surface phones or the Microsoft phones. Is it the end of the line for Surface hardware in general? Paul will debunk that rumor. And a whole lot more all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 539, recorded Wednesday, October 11th, 2017. Yesterday's office, tomorrow. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first delivery with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash windows. And by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash windows and entering the promo code windows and by wordpress your customers want to find you build a wordpress.com website and help them connect with your business get 15 percent off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash windows it's time for windows weekly the show where we cover the latest news from microsoft and two of the best in the biz are here on the left yes on the left today <laughs> mary joe foley from all about microsoft Dot com her ZDNet blog on the right in the blue trunks Paul Therott from Therott hello 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 <laughs> hello both of you it's great to see you and today we have to thank uh, uh, Jeff Jarvis and our friends at the City University of New York who provided you with an elegant office space <laughs> hey, Leo if you if you go to my Twitter account uh, you've tweeted it Twitter dot com slash Therott you will see an image that depicts Mary Jo Foley's incredibly technical setup today, <laughs> in which I believe she is using what appears to be a paper towel box of some kind to hold oh up her web camera. What is that? Uh, I went to the ladies' room here, and I stole a bunch of paper towels from there um, that were just sitting there. But I'm going to put them back at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. You know what? It works. Um, I can't see right, it. Right, it works. Work. It just works. Yeah. Yeah, so this right. is the the depth that we go to you to make this anything happen. To make this show go. Yep. Actually, what it tells me is how how foolish I was to build a multi million dollar studio. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I could have just yep. also you know cats like to play with it too. Oh yeah. Now is Sirachi uh, at home? I hope you didn't put him in a box and keep taking. He him is home. Him. Yeah, he's home. Good. All right. And if he's in a box, it was by uh, his own design. The cat loves boxes. Yeah, cats <laughs> do. They they feel safe in there. They do. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, what shouldn't feel safe? Windows Phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe Belfury put a nail a nail in the coffin, right? Uh, on Windows Phone. I, we're running out of room for nails. I got to be honest here. I well, don't know where the nail went. You know, I, I I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, I'm sad because it really it, it's it should have succeeded. It was a great operating system. It was unique. Uh, it would have been nice to have three choices instead of just mm -hmm. two. But at the same time. <laughs> This poor, this poor thing has been dragging on its yeah. tail on the cement for miles, and I think it's time just to say, yeah. You, oh, it's about two years past time. Yeah. But yes, yes. And all this, yeah. does this mean all the speculation about a Surface phone is <laughs> for naught? Uh, you know what? I would say yes, but uh, maybe, why don't you, do you have his quote ready to go, or do you have that? The Belfiore quote? You might be looking for it. Um, um or do you mean the Satya Nadella quote? No, I mean the Joe Belfiore one because he actually spe specifically mentioned uh, first-party hardware. Yeah, I don't have it. The gist of okay, so it, it, the the gist of it was is that the focus of Microsoft's effort is not on two things, which are the Windows 10 mobile operating system and phones hardware. Um, 
they, they will, of course, support Windows 10 Mobile with uh, security updates, um, quality updates, I guess we call them. But there will be no more new features, no more versions of the OS or whatever. Yeah. So, so Joe, Joe, when asked, is it time to leave the Windows Phone platform? There we go. Depends yeah. who you are. Many companies <laughs> still deploy to their employees. For example, if you are a human being and have a choice... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you might want to make uh, the right decision to buy a phone that people yeah. like. We'll support them. Yeah. But what about apps? Yes, that's a real problem. Yeah. We cannot fix ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> that was the ultimate problem. Is, uh, and it I was. think even yeah. Joe referred to that. Is that. You can't, you know, you. he even said we pay, we bought, we paid for apps. Yeah, he did. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated he admitted that because uh, when Windows Phone 8 was coming out, I received a bunch of internal documentation uh, that provided me with their strategy for making this platform succeed, which involved uh, paying app developers to port their apps to Windows Phone. And if that failed, to pay third-party developers to develop versions of those apps for Windows Phone. And they uh, paid millions and millions of dollars. Oh, um, in fact, you know, he even wrote says, apps for them, he said. Yeah. Facebook, for example, which Microsoft started. Uh, well, or did they start it? Well, I think maybe they, they, they financed that one. But uh, yeah, Microsoft made apps themselves for the platform for third-party apps. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So there you go. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, I think it's worth uh, acknowledging, but I think it's really important to say that uh, mm -hmm. it was a good platform. It's just Microsoft yeah. came to the table, I think, too late. Right? Too well, late. I would just temper that a little bit because I, I feel like it was a really good idea. Uh, the implementation maybe didn't match up to the the promise. And they had a switch. Remember, they switched underlying platforms at least three times in there. Right. Uh, which really screwed up the developer. You know, the developers who were, t you know, targeting Windows Phone were screwed up by those moves. Um, mm -hmm. And they also went down some paths that were ultimately unsuccessful, uh, integrated hubs and so forth. You know, they had this notion that, you know, instead of worrying about whether you're using Facebook or SMS messaging or whatever, you could use a single messaging app. And for an end user, this is something I still want. Um, I don't want to have to worry about that stuff. Or if you went into the Photos app, you could, uh, the Photos Hub at the time, you could integrate with all of the services you use. So if you used Flickr and, um, you know, Google Photos or whatever the services might be, that stuff would all be there. And this is another thing. It sounds wonderful for a user. You don't have to worry about that stuff. It's a great idea. It, but it leaves out one crucial component, which is that those services don't want that. And uh, Facebook wants you to use their app or their now their apps. Um, they don't want you to access Facebook features from within integrated parts of the OS, which is what Microsoft originally implemented for them. Um, Flickr and Google Photos or whoever does not want you to access their service through some photos experience on a phone. They want you to load their app. It's got their branding. It's got their style. It's got their stuff. You know, it, They want to interact directly with their own customers. So uh, there were some really good ideas. I mean, it was, really, it was thoughtful. You know, it, um, when you think about the explosion that was the iPhone and what the various responses were to them, um, you have companies that were in denial for a long time, like uh, Rim or BlackBerry. You've got a company like Google that basically said, well, we'll just copy it, you know, easy. We'll just copy the iPhone. Um, and then Microsoft responded differently. Uh, you know, they said, look, well, let, let's not just copy them. Let's try to do things better where we can. You know, let's really think this thing through. Of course, uh, you know, they took too much time as well, but yeah. it's too bad. But, but, you know, someone's going to say, but, um, there still are rumors about something called Andromeda, which is some kind of a mobile platform that Microsoft is believed to still be building, despite what Joe Belfiore tweeted. Well, I don't think those two things are... Um, Mutually exclusive. Right? Yeah. I, I, the thing you're referring to, the thing that Sachin Nadella kind of hints at in his book, I think is mm -hmm. more of a a different kind of mobile device. The thing you, yeah. you, you sort of refer to, if it were a Surface device, is Surface Mobile. Right. Right. Yep. Right. Yes. Um, so, I you know, to say they're completely out of first-party mobile hardware, I wouldn't go that far. But I would say they are not going to make a consumer phone handset, which, by the way, is something they've said for two years now, that they were not going to make any more consumer handsets. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Joe yeah, said, I, you know. uh, though, I mean, he said we want to uh, give our users the best experience on mm -hmm. yeah. other platforms. And actually, yeah. they've been doing a lot for Android lately, which is they interesting. Have. I mean, for a yeah, while, it was an iOS thing. You know, the first Office, Touch mm -hmm. Office was iPad. And 
Um, it's actually still fair to say, by the way, that many Microsoft mobile apps or whatever come out first still on iOS for some reason. I, th I feel like they have more experience or maybe even expertise on that platform. But, of course, Android is wide open. And one of the nice things about Android is they can take over the system in many yeah. ways. You know, yeah. get a Microsoft home screen, yeah. a Microsoft lock screen, a Microsoft yeah. keyboard. That's a good point. Uh, I mean, they now they brought Arrow back, right, which is their launcher. Right. I mean, yeah. if you're using an Android phone with all of that, yep. mm -hmm. how is that different than a Windows phone, really? I know. I oh, mean, okay. they've so, said that for a while, too, right? They they yeah. made that point. Like Satya Nadella, I forget what event that was. He held up his phone and he said, I have a non, oh, I think he had an iOS phone and said, um, yeah. I, you know, this is a Microsoft phone. I'm going to call it the Microsoft phone. Wow. Or sure. Wow. He said that? Wow. He I did. missed that one. The pro you know, <laughs> That must have disheartened sure a few people. I'm yeah. not sure how familiar we are with the uh, Windows fans. Um, they are a, a motley group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're really dedicated to this thing that, and they, they I, and a lot of them, I think, have a hard time understanding that the world has kind of moved on. And unfortunately, what I, I mean, it's amazing to me. But you, we're already getting complaints from people who say, you know, this uh, Microsoft launcher, Arrow launcher thing is cute and everything. But what I really want is tiles. I want this. I want that. You know, I, what what they want is Windows 10 Mobile or Windows Phone. They want that experience. Uh, maybe on Android, or you know, and I get that. I, I but the, the way I've described this to a couple of people, I think just via email by this point, is that you know, the Arrow launcher, the Microsoft launcher, as we're now calling it, is in many ways a more modern take on some of the principles that were behind Windows Phone in the beginning. And so the specifics might be a little different, right? It's not really yeah. easy or possible to do tiles on Android for the same reason, by the way, the timeline was delayed from Windows 10. You have to have buy-in from the developers that make the apps. Otherwise, this interface just sits there by itself and doesn't do anything. So you can't have live tiles unless apps know about live tiles. So um, yeah. it's it's kind of a chicken-egg thing. And that's never going to happen. No one's ever going to contort their Android apps to support some live, style scheme, live tile scheme that Microsoft makes. Um, but I, I think the thing that was really cool about Windows Phone is, and the idea behind Windows Phone is sort of what I was saying earlier, this idea of integration and these hubs and everything. And there was a, a people-centric approach, you know. So one of the things you can do on the Microsoft launcher is you can drag down a shortcut to a user. And I could say, you know, I want Mary Jo on my home screen as an icon. And when I tap on that icon, it could either just bring up a card that has the different things I can do, like uh, send her an email, send her a phone call, send her a text message, or I could hardwire it to a uh, specific action. I could say, when I tap on this icon, I always want to call Mary Jo on her primary cell phone number or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's That was the, you know, we can argue over the implementation details, but that was the kind of the central point behind Windows Phone from the very beginning. And so, um, I, I guess... I guess what I'm trying to say, as mm -hmm. kindly as possible, is um, maybe we could let go of the past a little bit, and um, as Microsoft has, by the way, and kind of accept mm -hmm. the world for what it is and see what's out there. I mean, by the way, there are other launchers, too. I mean, uh, you may be beholden to Microsoft for whatever reason, but the, the stock Android launcher isn't terrible. Samsung has their own launcher. There are many, power, uh, I should say, popular third-party launchers on Android. Um, I'm not really up on that uh, too much. And then, you know, Microsoft makes one as well. You can try that, too. Yeah, I mean, I, so both of you are now. I know Mary Jo's on a Android phone. Android. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Paul, did you? What are What are you using? Is your I'm also using an Android phone. So I had been using primarily an iPhone. I would say for the past year, year and a half, um, I switched to the to Android on the eve of the iPhone announcement. And and having seen what they announced, I actually feel okay about that. Um, I have ordered a Pixel XL, the new one, so I will yeah, roll I over. Yeah, I think that's going to be the one, the one to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the big one, the bezel, yep. bezelless. That's right. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I always like to be with the Google stuff because they're going to keep it up. I really, support. yeah, I have a strong affinity for it's kind of pureness, pure. you know, yeah. and I like that on the Microsoft side with like signature PCs or whatever. Right. Um, I like, like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although I've been uh, carrying until I get the Pixel XL, the the Note. Uh, eight. Yeah, it's nice. It's a really nice screen. I have to say, uh, nobody makes better screens than Samsung. I know. I really like those phones. I, I would be a okay with one of those. I, but in my own little kind of private calculus for what's important on a smartphone, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. But um, I've come to understand that I really like being on Project Phi 
Yeah, and of course, Phi that, is great. I, don't, I forgot it, you were Phi. Yeah, yeah. It, not, it nicely limits your choices. Obviously, I, yeah. I think that's going to yeah. change. But um, <laughs> well, you can but it really helps. It helps your laser soon. focus on what's important because yeah. when, once you yeah. know that's the case, um, no. you can you're, make you're, your decision. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, and I think the Pixel uh, 2 will be very. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty close. Yeah. It, it won't have yeah. the. I don't think it will have that nice curved uh, side no, thing. That's a. I don't know how good that is. I hit that yeah. all the time. It should be okay. Yeah. Uh, and the main point is that you then put on it, uh, if you want, you can make it very Microsoft centric. You then yeah, put you on it everything that you need. Yeah. In fact, I don't think I'll ever use it, but I could use Edge on Android soon, right? Yes. Tell me about that. That's weird. <laughs> yes. So um, Microsoft announced right the day after we did Windows Weekly last week uh, that uh, they were coming out with uh, Edge apps for iOS and Android. So they didn't actually take the Edge browser and port it to these platforms. They couldn't because they needed to use the rendering engines of both of both iOS and Android natively. But what they did do is take the look and feel of Edge so that people can uh, be able to sync their bookmarks, uh, reading lists, and all of those kinds of things across the platforms if they are Edge users on Windows 10. But the real reason they did this was a little more complicated, I think. So at Build, Microsoft talked about this whole idea of, you know, we're, we realize we are not, in the mobile space, in the in the consumer handset space. So the way we want to kind of come at the market is to put Windows 10 PCs at the center and try to make it so that if you have a Windows 10 PC and an iOS or an Android device, you'll be able to um, connect a, more seamlessly across these devices. And the feature that they do this with is called Connect to PC or Connect Your PC. I can never remember which way it is. Continue, continue to. I'm oh, sorry. Continue, continue to PC. Right. So um, the idea for them, um, you know, kind of like the big picture idea is, we want to keep Windows relevant to users' computing experiences, even if they're using an iOS or an Android device. The way we do that is. We realize that sometimes people do want to look at things on a bigger screen or work with things on a on a bigger screen. And so in those cases where, say, you have a spreadsheet on your phone, but you actually want to manipulate it on your PC, they'll allow you to seamlessly send yourself the link to what you're working on so that you can open it right on your PC. It'll open automatically if you want, or you can save it for later and have it open later. I think it's kind of an ingenious idea. I'm not sure um, how many people are going to take advantage of it, but it's it's an interesting, tr you know, kind of hail mary pass to see if right. they can keep Windows at the center. It's a little um, it's a little convoluted. It is uh, because if if you're familiar with how sharing works on a mobile device, um, you know that within some app there'll be a share icon of some kind. You tap it, and the share sheet comes up, whatever it looks like on Android or iOS, and that continue on PC icon is one of the choices right oh, so well, that's not uh, too you guess it's not too yeah um but the the reason to have edge come over is that that action can be automatic right so right. the nice thing about uh, edge on android or ios is that you could have tabs open this doesn't work right now in the preview but eventually it will um you might have a web page that you're viewing whatever it is and you can just go over to the PC and open it up and you can access those things just like you can today on you know chrome let's say or whatever and i i think the the point of bringing well, there's a, there are a number of reasons to bring Edge to mobile. I mean, just the ability to sync bookmarks and passwords and form fill and whatever cookies, uh, whatever, uh, is useful. Um, they could probably have written a utility or a cloud service that would have done that behind the scenes to popular mobile browsers like Chrome and Safari for sure. But I think that the 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 act of continuing where you picked up where you left off on a different device is particularly important on the web, and I think they wanted to have a more seamless experience for what's probably going to be the majority usage for this kind of thing. And by bringing their own app to iOS and Android, they can bypass the share screen, ultimately, and you can just access that stuff automatically. And so just like, again, right. like you can in Chrome, there'll be some interface where you can go up and say, open the tabs in some other browser, and the other browser might be on mobile, not just on a Windows 10 PC. So it's, it's useful, and it, and it kind of ties into a wider ecosystem of um, Windows 10 to device integration. You know, there's going to be the cloud clipboard feature, the timeline feature, which t actually dies, ties into this, the 
Um, what else is there? The I don't know. Cortana does this. Cortana plugins? will pop up. Does it support the uh, desktop plugins on the? No, it doesn't mobile? support plugins. But it's it's in a preview right now, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, if that will happen or not. It supports right now. I would say even you know, it's only on iOS right now. It's only iPhone too. I should say it's uh, you can run it on an iPad, but it's just the iPhone app. Um, I'm sure that will change. You know, I think this thing gets more sophisticated over time. But it, it, it has all the basic features. It has the edge look and feel, which I think is nice. Um, it works well if you switch between portrait and landscape, and it kind of respects that kind of thing well. Um, it does. It has a reading view, so if you're reading an article, you can tap the icon and, and see it without all the distractions. Obviously, t all the tab stuff, incognito mode. Um, it, it syncs. I don't think it does passwords yet, but they, they they're, that's yeah. part of it, right? So in the preview period, they're going to get that. Other stuff going like tab syncing and so forth I is not be, there to me, right now. Bookmarks and uh, passwords and tabs really are more important to me than the con continue on desktop feature. Yeah, Maybe and by the way, also, yeah, and by the way, to the average user, and uh, by which I mean to all users, basically, mm -hmm. um, also more important than like the rendering engine. You know, there's a lot right, of. Well, they, <laughs> I, correct me if I'm wrong, but on the iPhone, they have to use WebKit. They can't. That's right. Yeah. You, so that's I don't. Does does it use well, WebKit way, on, on Windows? No. no, no, they have their so own. So they can't thing. use so, the Edge engine on the iPhone anyway. So it's really a skin right. on basically any browser on the iPhone is really just Safari yep. with a skin. But they're yeah. also it's interesting because they're also doing that on Android. So they're not using oh, WebKit on Android. They're using mm -hmm. Blink or whatever. They're using the the yeah. Chrome rendering. Oh, that's, engine. you so, don't have to do that on Android, but that is no, you don't. A lot but it's it's, it's it's a good yeah. approach because it's the same app, right? That, you right. know, on both Makes it uh, systems, it's going to be feature uh, similar, or feature right. identical. Um, uh, they it, are, makes it is on the desktop closer to Chrome, I think. I mean, I mean, wasn't that the whole yeah. point of, that they could? They said initially you could use Chrome plugins. Uh, yeah, that's probably yeah. true. Yeah. So I imagine it's the same. Blink is Google's engine. But I think you know, uh, you know, again, most people what they want is like I have a database of passwords. I have a database right. that's of what uh, bookmarks. Yeah. You know, that's what matters. And you can you can sync it one on a one time deal, I guess. But like you know, the ability to just have that stuff work seamlessly over time is what you're really looking for. Yep. So I, agree. I think they're doing the right thing. So you know the. The other part about their launcher that we were talking about before. So, we, you know, they have this Arrow launcher for Android. Now they are, um, I guess I guess this replaces it, the Microsoft launcher that they talked about this, this past week. But the idea, again, here is they want launcher um, to be the best way for doing this continue on PC um, right. kind of feature. So they, they're they making it so if you use the launcher on Android, and they can't do this on, on an iPhone because Apple isn't allowing that, but you could actually at some point like press and hold a photo on your phone and the a photo will automatically op open up on your Windows 10 PC. Yeah. This And by the way, this these capabilities, when you combine them all together, has, has caused, again, because we can't help ourselves in the Microsoft world, um, uh, some enthusiasts to sort of wonder, like, well, why does Microsoft sell a phone that is yeah. maybe, I don't know, a Galaxy S8 Plus or something that has the Microsoft launcher on it, that has the Swift Key keyboard on it, that has the Microsoft lock screen, whatever it's called, um, that has, you know, all the continue on PC built in, that has all the stuff built in. You know, Microsoft Edge is the default browser and Cortana is the default assistant. Right. Um, I think they, they're already doing this, right? They're selling it through other parties. Like, yeah. isn't there a Samsung phone already that they sell in the Microsoft store that has oh, that would be a lot of Microsoft clever. apps yeah, populated? Just, oh, that was the deal but, with my, uh, Samsung. That's right. 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 But, my, you know, I saw people saying, so Microsoft should just build an Android phone. But why? Why would they do it, right? Like, what what would Microsoft get yeah. out of building an Android it's, well, phone? Well, I guess the question to ask ourselves, because what, what's the, you know, better than anybody, what's the Sachin Nadella phrase about growth, uh, growth mindset or whatever? Yeah. Um, you know, the Microsoft uh, Lumia Android phone is not the next billion dollar business for this company, right? Um, right. I think it would be detrimental to Microsoft's mobile efforts if they had a another failure in mobile hardware right now. I, I think that would be a mistake. So people who want to do this can do it. And people yeah. like Mary Jo and I who write about this stuff for a living can you know, explain why you may or may not want to do that or how you might want to do that or whatever. Um, yeah. Microsoft doing it themselves, uh, like, yeah. I don't I know. know. I, I will say, kind of tied to that thing we talked about earlier about the underlying rendering engine, the thing that's interesting there is unlike on Windows, uh, Microsoft can update Edge at any time because it's just a shell on top of something else that someone else is doing. And so 
Edge should take advantage of whatever advan- you know, whatever improvements happen to the underlying rendering engine over time, probably more frequently on Android than on iOS. Um, but they, all, they, all they really have to focus on is the app itself. And it's kind of freeing in a way when you think about it, right? You don't have to worry about matching or beating the other browsers from a performance perspective or from a, you know, whatever the, whatever the things are, you know, that you look at in that space. I mean, they can just make a good app. And we know that the underlying rendering engines on those platforms are already pretty great. So uh, there's no, no real worry there anymore. Right. I think, though, um, a jo- I, I talked to Jill Belfiore about this whole idea and why they were doing it and all. And one of the last things he said to me during our call was, you know what we're doing? We're taking all the things that Windows Phone users loved and love, and we're bringing them to Android. Well, like I said, I, I think conceptually <laughs> that's true. Right. I, the, the problem yeah. is no, the pedantic world of tech enthusiasts, uh, they are literally not doing that. And that is the no. problem, you know. Exactly. Um, they're taking it. They're taking that. A lot of people are saying, oh, so see what he's saying. He's saying they're going to make an Android phone. Yeah. No, he isn't saying that, actually. He's saying, you know, by customizing the Android screen with the Microsoft launcher, yeah. they are making something that has a lot. Of, not everything that, you know, Windows Phone had. I mean, there aren't live tiles on Android. Right. But yeah. you are able to customize the, the home screen on the launcher. Um in a lot of different ways. So they're they're kind of coming as close as they can to replicating the Windows Phone experience on Android without actually making an Android phone. That's, Here, here's, that's how um, I- here's some unsolicited advice for everybody. Um, instead of just <laughs> Microsoft sizing your phone or whatever, um, why don't you independently evaluate uh, various launchers, various keyboards, various home screens yeah. or lock screens, whatever various personal digital assistants and then make the right choice. You know, um, I, I think blindly picking some platform approach or some company approach or whatever is not necessarily the best idea. Um, these things taken in isolation can be very useful. And so if you have decided that you want to use edge on mobile, right, uh, which mm-hmm. some people will do. In fact, Microsoft thinks it's about, a, what is it? 330 million people, whatever the number is. Um, it doesn't matter. Millions of people. Um, well, you know what? Having Edge on Android and iOS is great. And by the way, because you are using the underlying rendering engine, there's something you don't have to worry about. You know, if if a page comes up in that browser, you know it's going to come up fine because it's running Safari or Chrome. It's going to be great. You know, so it's kind of a no risk kind of a thing. If you use Edge for two months and it doesn't work out, guess what? Everything's fine. All right. Yeah. Again, as long as it syncs my bookmarks. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm happy. Yeah. Right, and it does that. You have to sign yeah. in with a Microsoft account. Yeah. But, it, it, but it does do that. I'm doing it right now. Actually, I'm, I'm putting the Arrow launcher on, which is actually pretty nice. It is. Yeah. It is I'm pretty kinda, nice. I'm kind of impressed by it. It's um. The, and by the way, the, that is something that's worth spending time with because it's not just the um. There's a lot the kind of, of basics stuff. of it. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of stuff, and it and it's highly personalizable. Uh, pers- <laughs> highly configurable, I guess. <laughs> um, there's a lot of personalization in there, yeah. and it's it's worth kind of stepping through each of the little screens and looking at the options because there's some neat stuff in there. Yeah, I'm doing. It's got a frequently used. It's got the Bing wallpaper, which I like. It's got the frequently yeah. used app. I love the I love menu. daily wallpaper switch. You know, uh, this is this is good. Yeah, it All is right, good. But can, can I ask a question about a launcher? Because I tried the Arrow launcher when I first got my Android phone, and I don't understand why <laughs> I would use it. Like, yeah, well, that's that's sort of what I was getting at. Like, in other words, from the perspective of uh, like a Microsoft fan, they're yeah. saying, "Well, I want this thing because Microsoft has promised me this is going to be a lot like Windows Phone, yeah. and I, this is what right. I want on my phone." And and because you as a normal person, like, I don't understand this. What's the difference? Um, no, because isn't it supposed to help you get access to your most frequently used apps? Yes. Well, no? uh, one of the things it can do is it can it can auto curate your yeah. home screen to display the apps you use the most. So as, right? if you, I, you have to enable app usage monitoring, which I did. Yeah. And now I, actually, I can either slide up and see most used apps here. I don't have to do a lot of icon customization or slide right. over and see most used yeah. apps right here. Yeah. Um, I, guess, so, I'm, I guess I don't have enough apps to make it. Here, here, are, here are some of the ways <laughs> in which you... Well, well, no, but it I, also well, replaces you know. the look and feel. So, so for instance, yeah. if you get a Samsung phone and you don't like, which most don't, yeah. Samsung's TouchWiz interface... Right. You mm-hmm. can completely customize. That's one of the real advantages yeah. of Android. I actually don't. Is, I never use nice. either Google's or Samsung's. 
launcher. Yep. I use. Some people just want to use the launcher. I, 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 from uh, I think a lot of people's perspective, um, you know, people complain about like the whack-a-mole interface on the iPhone, for example. It's a grid of icons, and it doesn't scale yep. very well when you have hundreds and hundreds of apps. Um, yeah, okay, but you know, most people just uh, muscle memory where they want to go to hit the right app, yep. and they go. And to them, right. the UI is is nothing. It's there. It's about running the apps. They don't really care about yep. that thing that's underneath. Um, I mentioned the kind of people-centric approach they have. Like if, if depending on the way you think, depending on the way, the way you do things, and if you think about it, Microsoft in some ways has been working on this stuff for like 20, 25 years now. Um, you could approach your phone from the perspective of a communications device where it's not so much about the apps, it's about the people. Mm -hmm. And so you could say, well, I, I want to talk to Brad or Paul or Raphael or whatever, and I'm going to have their faces on my home screen, and that's how I think. Like it makes sense to me that I want to tap on their face and, uh, yeah. Call them, Skype them, you know, whatever it might be. Um, it's just a different way of doing things. Uh, it yeah. supports different styles. I, I, like Leo said, I think the the primary strength of Android is that it's open, and by being open, it means that you can change anything, and that's it helps Microsoft, but it also, you know, for a lot of people that use Android, that's actually kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's more. It's just making it yours, and the thing, yeah. about, yeah, the thing about Android users is. It's like Windows users to some degree. Windows yeah. enthusiasts love to customize. Yes. I th uh, yeah, I think, I don't know if my experience is typical, but I noodle around a lot with different things. I've tried all the different keyboards. I've tried all the different assistants. I've tried all the different, you know, launchers. And I and usually end up going back to the clean thing. Like I, to me, uh, the default, it's like, it's like cars. You know, sometimes people buy a 30,000 vehicle and then spend $20,000 putting it up on lifts and adding under lighting and right. different stereos and stuff. And it's like, I just want the stock thing. You know, I, I like the, I like the thing for what it is. Um, maybe if it was a Samsung, I wouldn't actually, but you know, like stock Android, I, I think it's clean and it works and I'm okay with it. You know, that's just me, but you have, that's the beauty. Like if you don't, if yeah. that's not your deal, fine. You can change it. Well, and the whole point of it, I think the Aero Launcher would be, if you do want to kind of have a, a Microsoft ecosystem, it right. syncs to all of your Outlooks, and, yeah. you know, your Microsoft yeah. account. So I think, I think Mary Jo kind of hinted at this notion that in the future, especially, this might enable quicker interactions between the phone and the PC, right? That uh, the right. continue on PC thing is a little kludgy right now. But um, if you use this launcher... Uh, maybe some of those actions going back and forth will be easier. This is actually pretty impressive. The, the other issue is that if you use a third-party launcher, sometimes you using launchers from some strange person. You never, yeah. you don't, yeah. you don't know who they are. Yep, so, and they, they think about things differently than you do, and it might not make sense to you. Or right, this is actually you know. this is not bad. I I'm actually surprised. Uh, I just well, Arrow, just I mean, Arrow Launch has always been great. Like the truth yeah. is, like this is this was a garage product. Uh, the way that Belfiore described it in the blog post was that they promoted it. Like this has come out of the garage. Like this is now a officially supported Microsoft product. Like uh, Microsoft has put the full weight of the company behind it. Now it's something they're going to do stuff with. Um, it's not just two guys working on yeah. it in the back room somewhere. I'm impressed. Yeah, it's got Bing or Bing search bar at the top. So that's the other thing. You know, I mean, yeah, right. Well, by the way. <laughs> You can change. Oh, no, that's Edge. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you can you change can't, it. You can't, right? I don't think you can. And Edge, you can. You can change the You can browser? change the search engine in Edge on iOS to Google. Yeah. You, you might be able to. Let me oh, look. Well. I mean, Arrow has a ton Arrow, of I don't settings Arrow, in here. Yeah. It's possible there's some Bing integration here that precludes that. But. Okay. It's got a lot. Yeah, no, I was surprised by that, too. Someone asked, and I was yeah. like, yeah, there's no way. And then I went in, I'm like, oh, actually. Yeah. <laughs> actually, you can change that. Amazing. Good for them. Um, there's... Yeah, there's a lot. I can't be sure. But. Yeah, there's, like I said, there's a lot in there. Like, it, yeah. it, it really is going to require some time and effort to kind of figure this thing out. Yeah, this is good. It's got this utility page, which is very useful. You can customize that. Um, it supports gestures. Swipe up to extend dock, swipe down, double tap my screen to lock. I mean, this is, but this is one of the reasons I like Android is this yeah. is, you know. Yeah, it's impressive. I mean. Yeah, I, I phone people go, why, why would you want to do any of that? <laughs> just, just you know what, I'm going to give it another try. I'm going to give it another try and see if it does anything for Yeah, me. I mean, I think now that it's been kind of formalized, and of course, as part of this process, they updated it a lot too. Um, it might be look, worth looking at yep. again. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, we we were both surprised, I think it's fair to say, that Microsoft did bring Edge to Android and iOS because they've been asked this multiple times in different Q&As and all, and they're always like, you know what, Edge is a Windows thing. Yep. And then it was like, and surprise, here it is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's again. It's not the full browser because it's not the rendering engine underneath. But I don't think that's important. I, I I don't either. I don't. I agree with you. I don't think that is what people like. I don't think anybody's like. Oh, it doesn't have the Edge HTML I, rendering I, engine. I yeah. use Chrome on iOS, or I did, you know, uh, because yeah. it synced all that stuff over, and I, that was what was important to me. Uh, the yeah. Safari rendering engine's excellent. I don't care about that. Like it, it's just work. It's right. fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and one other thing that Joe Belfiore said to me, um, I said to him, so, you know, now that you're doing a lot of do new things with Edge, are you ever going to bring Edge to the Windows Store and make it a separately updatable app for Windows? And he said, we are looking at that still, and we have not ruled that out yet. I wonder what the holdup is there. It seems so obvious. Uh, I know. Because the app itself needs yeah. to be updated. Right? I know. The rendering engine stuff, you know, whatever, that can be twice a year. It could be once a year. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. I don't know why. I, I think he, he said something to me like, we're trying to figure out how and if we can bring it to the store. So there's still, you know, I, I think we had said before on the show that they had ruled that out completely and we're not going to do it. But he said, no, we're still considering it. And they know that it, they need to be updating Edge on Windows more than, you know, twice a year, which is how. Yeah, right. That, and that's now. the central issue. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, yeah. Joe, Joe has just been a fountain of information lately. I love it. Keep up the good work, <laughs> JB. A long period of silence. Yeah. Is his hair, what color is it these days? Yeah, really. Is it black? Uh, I don't know. It may be bl like partially blonde. Isn't, isn't he back to if that the, again? If the word frosted is going to enter into this conversation, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> just the tips, man. Just the tips. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's take a little break. When we come back, uh, more about Windows 10. 1709, a.k.a. the FCU. That is not good. <laughs> we will not call it the FCU. No, we will not. <laughs> sure. Uh, we'll find something family-friendly for that. And yeah. <laughs> that's not unfriendly. It's just, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not the best. Yeah, yeah. Our show today brought to you by The Best the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country, and for good reason. In fact, today's, our, today's Blue Apron Day in the little port house. I always look forward to the box. The box comes with three meals, everything I need to make three meals, all the ingredients, fresh, delicious, even the fish and the meat are never frozen, refrigerated box, amazing. I don't know how they get the quality of the produce so high, but it's always perfect, better than I probably would have picked in the store, and that's always fun. And you get ingredients you've never tried before. You get add re recipes to your repertoire, which is really fun. And I think there is something about cooking from scratch. The thing is, this makes cooking from scratch as easy as possible. No shopping, no prep. It's ready to go, 40 minutes or less. And the house fills with a beautiful aroma. And we just did the catfish sandwiches. Those were so good. I don't know what we're getting this week. You get to choose, by the way. Just go to the menu. There are two Blue Apron plans. There's a plan for couples and a family plan. Sugar and brown butter chicken with roasted fall vegetables. That sounds so good. Yeah, we just had the Cajun, Cajun spice, spiced catfish sandwiches. Really delicious. Kind of a po' boy, I guess, is what I, I guess I made a po' boy. Fennel crusted pork chops and fig compote with sautéed kale and farro salad. I, thanks to Blue Apron, I know, I know Mary Jo knows farro, but the, this is the first time I've ever tried farro. I now am a farro fan. Farro fan. In fact, that's another great thing about it. I always get new and interesting stuff. Vegetarian choices, choices for a variety of dietary needs, of course. Here's the vegetarian meal. Broccoli risotto and soft-boiled eggs with pistachio and grana padano cheese. <gasps> Oh, I love it. So you get the recipe card. It walks you through the process. You do not have to have no prior experience necessary. By the way, they're celebrating. This is their fifth anniversary. They've been around for five years, and they're doing it by bringing back the top 20 all-time most favorite recipes, none of which I've tried. I can't wait. Right now, all your favorites back on the menu for a limited time only. Less than $10 a person. It's less than you'd spend in a, in a grocery store. 
but it's fabulous and there's never any wastage. Actually, with the, the two-person plan, we feed Michael as well. We really get three meals out of it. Blue Aprons uh, created partnerships with over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranches across the United States. So the meat is uh, from responsibly raised animals. The seafood is sourced sustainably. The produce comes from farms that practice regenerative farming. And they ship the exact amount you need so you'll never have too much. Less food waste. I love it. Can't wait to go home and cook tonight. Blueapron.com slash windows. Get $30 off your first delivery with free shipping. And don't forget, fifth anniversary means some really fun recipes. All-time customer favorite recipes and $30 off your first delivery. Going to blueapron.com slash windows. Blueapron.com slash windows. Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley in the beautiful confines of the City University of New York J School. The Pennsylvania State Pen Penitentiary <laughs> for the criminally insane. Do you, when you go back to a college, do you have my, the same experience I do, which is, I am so glad I'm not in college anymore. Yes. <laughs> it's it's fun weird, to be able to read what feeling. you want, write what you want, you know, yeah. live as you want. I loved college. I loved it. Nothing sure. wrong with it, but you, you know, it was a sense of freedom when it stopped. Right? I feel like walking into the commons and just being like, so what are you guys doing? Are you exchanging yeah, what's up? ideas. Yeah, what's, what's up? What's, hey. what's up, kid? Hey. It'd be like that. What was that movie where the guys started the frat to go back to school? Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back like, to school. Back to school, I think was the name. Yes. It oh, just, no, no, no. It was the... Um, what was it? You were my boy, Blue. What was that? Uh... It's all right. I didn't mean to hurt your brain. <laughs> Back to School is the Rodney Dangerfield movie. Oh, that, that was a good one. I liked that one. That was fun. What's, what is the Old name school. That? Old school. Thank you. Chat room always knows. Yeah. Always. So, the FCU is finally due. Yes, it is. I feel like we've been saying this every week for six weeks. I know. Weeks, you know? We have. We have. Has uh, Donna but, Sakar weighed in yet? No, but Brandon LeBlanc weighed in ah. this week. Oh. That's as close as we're going to get. I know. Right. So um, it's funny. Somebody asked Brandon LeBlanc on Twitter, Brandon, is build 16299.15 RTM, <laughs> as in release to MJF? <laughs> and, he, and he said in one word, yes. Oh, I love it. Release to MJF. <laughs> now, You're before famous. I get off on a rant, I just want to point out that Mary Jo has foolishly forgotten to bring her going to this. So I did. Oh, you can you can rant. You can rant all uh, you want. There is a commonality to the two major stories we've discussed so far today. And what is that commonality? Uh, Microsoft announcing something important to an individual on Twitter, not to the <laughs> world, via a press release, a blog post, or some other public event of some kind. That literally, in response to one human being. One human being on uh, from Microsoft has revealed the thing we want to know. But that's the way the world is now, man. Uh, listen, you talk old school. You said, uh, "I'm sorry, school. but uh, this is not this is not <laughs> acceptable." I, I <laughs> you're just jealous. No, no, I, 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 I you know, Leo, I see clarity in all things. Like yes, I, yes, to do. me, um, announcing or revealing things like this to to an individual on Twitter is like, mm. you know spitting into the wind like it doesn't that doesn't do it well even in what's funny as an at reply which makes it even less visible right oh, that's just terrible. the only people who see it yeah. are people who follow both right. of you right and the only reason i saw it was somebody tweeted to me hey did you see oh. that yeah. he said this but i guess yeah. they yep. figure well mary joe will put the word out yeah I, look, that that's a fine strategy. Um, you know, ping Mary Jo and let her know that this yeah. happened. Send her a press release. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you just want... It doesn't have to be like a fax. It could come electronically. Yeah. I'm not trying to be completely old-fashioned. I just... But <laughs> yeah. I think it should be something official. So, no, it should fax be a fax. Paul Surratt. Yeah. yeah, only it should, Paul. Okay, okay. It should be on company letterhead, obviously. <laughs> Uh, this is the world we live in, Paul. I agree with you. I, I bemoan it, but it is the world we live in. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Uh, uh, 
Can you know, the CUNY but, School of Journalism is with me, Leo. They know. Oh, they know. <laughs> it's not the right way to do they things. Know but you difference. know what? We have to encourage this new openness on Microsoft's That's part. They're starting point. small. They're yeah. starting small, but like it's better than just not saying anything. They said something. It's true. If you release the source code to Linux to one person on Twitter, did you release the source code to no. Linux? Or no. You That's just... a good point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> No, that's an excellent point. Yeah. I don't get it. I know. But there was no it. other official announcement? No. no. Just that one tweet. Yeah. Right. Which Mary Jo wouldn't have even seen because she's I wise enough well, not to read understand. it. The rest of us have become like um, like tea leaf <laughs> readers or whatever. Like, right. um, you know, we know, for example, that when they first released this bill to the fast ring and then immediately released it to the slow ring, oh, something might be up here. Right. And... Um, uh, yesterday or two days ago, whatever it was, they released this bill to the release preview uh, ring. Now, that's the final, to me, that is the final confirmation, really, because you don't put something into the release preview ring unless you are literally going to release it to the public. That's what that ring is right. for. So, this is it. I mean, there's no doubt. We've been kind of saying that for a week or two now, but yeah. I think I would say this confirms it. So well, this is 16299.15. Of course. Right. What else would you use for <laughs> the final folder? AKA 1709. All right. Well, and then Donna uh, Sarkar just tweeted today, no no new builds today, Windows Insiders, but check your ring settings because the next one will be Redstone 4. So that also tells you we're done. Right. They're, yep, they're, that's they're true. moving on. They're going, away. Yep. they're going to the next version. I also have a tip, I think, related to this very topic, so let's not speak too much okay. on that subject right now. But, right. Um, okay. yes. yeah, that's, but you're right. That's that Donna could, yeah, that saying, hey. Yep. 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 The time has come. Yes. All right. So it's happening. Yep. It's happening. Next week, in fact, October 17th is when it starts rolling out. Um, they've already said that. So, um, you know, what we're expecting will happen is you'll get the um, you'll get these final bits. If You know, the, I, I think, again, a staged rollout. Some people will get them first. Um, then... There also probably will be at least one cumulative update right away once you get the final bits because they have been continuing to do fixes and make improvements to the fall creators update even after they declared this particular build as done, right? Yeah. I, I got to tell you, you know, I've complained a lot about the frequent updating on Windows 10, but the one thing I'm actually behind and I, I, I have no problem with is this notion that they kind of freeze the build at the build number we know but like she said you know we're going to get a cumulative update on day one and that's fine yeah <laughs> you know yeah, it, it that's is. absolutely yeah. fine because the truth mm -hmm. is if you installed it on october 17th or if you waited until next june 17th or whatever date in between it does not matter you will also install a cumulative update every single time and that's fine it's absolutely yeah. fine it's fine right it's okay okay yeah Okay. It's not like the Windows Phone thing. It's okay. Yeah, we've been talking about this for so long. I feel like there's I nothing know. to say except that. Well, get ready. I know. Is there is there anything to worry week. about? Oh, is it is, is it is it stable? Is it? I mean, there's nothing to say really. Well, it wasn't this. I think it was this particular build sixteen two nine nine that had a bug in it that made Windows Media Player um, disappear from oh. some people's builds. Okay. Oh and my god. Yeah. We'll hear so about that yesterday, one, won't we? <laughs> no, yesterday I saw an Leo. article on Forbes. Pe friends don't let friends read Forbes, remember. And they said, oh, this is it. Microsoft, first they kill Groove Music Pass, yep. and oh, now no. they're killing Windows Media Player. And so I, I went to Microsoft, and I'm like, wait, are you killing Windows Media Player? And they said, uh, no, that was a bug in the so, Insider build. <laughs> this was the exact line, I believe, from the Forbes article, which was, you can pry Windows Media Player from my cold, dead fingers. Oh, Lord. <laughs> to which I replied, uh, you know, good for you, Hotshot. Like, nobody cares about this software. Like, nobody. Nobody cared about it when it was new. Like, it's... <laughs> I seriously, it's like it's like missing QuickTime or something. Like seriously, like it, this is not a beloved thing. It's it's well, in there for legacy reasons. Don't you need? Yeah, it? it's it, yeah. You need the yes. It's it's in there. It's not getting. It's not going away. Um, they can't get rid of it. They want to. I'm sure it's terrible. But <laughs> what do you? There use? was nothing. So you use you the Groove Music Player. What do you use to? Play well, there's a media? there's a movies and TV app that plays videos, which okay. is actually, by the way, quite good. Um, is that the default launch or yes? Not Windows. Oh, so this is really, you're right. You have to try hard to use Windows you Media don't, Player. Yeah, you can do yeah. it. It's, it's in there. It's like the Internet Explorer. You can go find it okay. if you want. Okay. But you don't need it. 
I, I don't know because I probably just always install VLC and just let it handle everything. Yeah, of course. Like an yeah. insane person. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, so actually movies and TV is a lot like Microsoft Edge in the sense that A, nobody uses it, but B, you kind of do want to use it if you can, especially when you're on battery power because those apps actually uh, provide much better battery power for what they do respectively. So if you care about battery power a lot, Browse, browse web with Edge. That's going to give you much better battery life than uh, Chrome or, or whatever. Well, Chrome, I guess. Um, when it comes to playing movies, like you're right, uh, VLC is a much better video player in the sense that it has better features and so forth. But uh, actually, if you care, you know, you want to make it across the country, across the ocean, whatever it is, and watch movies. Um, if you can play that thing in movies and TV, you should do it because you're actually going to get much better battery life when That's you do that. Enough. All right. Yeah. That's a good tip. Yep. Oh, there it is, Windows Media Player. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I've never yeah. apparently never used it. Another, it said, another thing <laughs> uh, for, uh, for for faux outrage in the Windows community. Yeah. Great. Oh, they're killing you know it what? now. Uh, every once in a while, it opens. Well, I do something and it opens. I'm like, oh yeah, Windows Media Player. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's crap. Like, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah. terrible software. So if I okay, good. So if I um, if I just turn on. It's like try to launch uh, music or, so, or a video. It won't launch. It, it will never launch yeah. this software. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there may be some esoteric um, uh, video format that is only, you know, for some reason is tied to Windows Media Player, but I doubt it. You could right click a video and say open with and then Windows yeah, Media Yeah, yeah, you'd see it. Yeah. 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 You can also not have it on. Uh, you can uninstall it. Like you can go into the Windows features control panel and remove it i believe like Probably you don't need to have the app. it's got codecs and things right that's what's <laughs> yeah but i think those things stay on the system if you remove the app you can probably just get rid of the app yeah there's no reason to it like you never really run into it yeah, it's not I a... launch music groove music launches when i try to yeah. play music and uh, i don't have any videos on here so i don't know but hmm okay okay this is a pretty clean machine. I only use it for work. This surface. Well, if you would upgrade it all the way from Windows 95, you'd still have that cute little skiing video. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Weezer. I'd have was, Weezer on here. Yeah. Probably like an, it was probably a move file or something too. Yeah. I don't even remember. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Or no, it was an AVI. Like any sense. Oh, AVI. Yeah, it was it's, like a 320 by 240 yeah, AVI. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like up an entire CD or something. What's this about price increases for Windows downgrades? That makes. Yeah, I, mean, I don't Joe, get what, that. Uh, What's that? Okay. <laughs> Was that me? No, that was no. me. Sorry. <laughs> um, right. So um, there are two things happening on the pricing front that mostly affect small and mid-sized business customers more than anyone else. And they have to do with what Microsoft's going to do around pricing when the fall creators update comes out. Um, the first thing that's going on is Microsoft is adding a new edition of Windows 10 to its lineup that's called Windows 10. 10 Pro for workstations. But that will be inexpensive. <laughs> uh, it's not that inexpensive. Um, but here, here's the thing. Here's the reason this story is a little bit hard to explain. Uh, what I found out from my contacts is pricing that Microsoft is charging OEMs for these versions of Windows 10. Um, and OEMs have the option of passing those costs on to customers or not. <laughs> they can pass them on, um, you know, as uh, and make it as expensive as they want to recoup their costs or not. I wonder which they'll choose. You know, sometimes they don't choose what you think they do because they, they want to compete against other products that are in the market. So um, I've seen a price list for what Microsoft is planning to charge for some of these additions. And Windows 10 Pro for workstations for up to four cores – uh, Microsoft is charging OEMs $144 per copy. Oh, that's not that bad, actually. Um, but compare, to, compare that to Windows 10 Pro Standard, it's that's $117. Yeah. So it's $30 more for Windows 10 Pro uh, for workstations over what they are charging but, for Standard. But they flipped a registry switch for you. I don't understand why you don't think it's worth that extra. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> extra bit of money. Well, that, so the, the way I found out about this is interesting. So OEMs are out there warning some customers about this price increase. And they're saying to them, hey, by the way, Microsoft's just about to uh, introduce this Windows 10 for workstations thing. And so you guys who've been running Windows 10 Pro on, you know, higher class hardware, you may end up paying this price price differential. And it could be quite a bit because what Microsoft's going to do is start charging per um, I believe, for Xeon 
and Opteron processors. So I've had a couple of people say to me, all right, I already have a machine with an, a Xeon processor. What's going to happen to me when Fall Creator's update comes out? Oh, Am I suddenly going to be charged awesome question. more? And I said, I don't know, but I would think you are going to. That would be my guess. So the, the thing is, though, that person today would be running Windows 10 Pro. Correct. So Windows 10 Pro is not limited in any way as to its support for the processor cores that are in that system, right? They're, in right. other words, so they're they're taking full advantage of that system today. Are they right. downgrading the capabilities of Windows 10 Pro so that that is no longer the case? Yes. Oh. Um, so, like uh, <laughs> the so, Resilient File yeah. System ReFS, ReFS isn't going to be available. Creation of ReFS files is a Windows 10 Pro for workstations only feature from now on. Sweet. So, if you're somebody who uses ReFS, you are going to need the workstation version, and you won't be able to use Pro. Wow. Okay. Uh, right. Well, okay, but I actually I th I could be wrong about this, but I believe RAFS is only for creation capabilities. So if the disk is yeah. already there, right. you yeah. should be okay. What you will lose is the ability to create new Correct. volumes to create that new. file system. I think. Yes, I think um, you're right too. Yeah. But what about the processor? Are you saying that I don't? Yeah. I, I that I don't actually understand. Is there? Yeah. So that I don't understand either. Um, and, my, you know, Microsoft's not talking about this pricing. I mean, this is confidential information. They're like, hey, OEMs aren't supposed to be talking about this. I uh, mean, can you imagine getting a bill for $170, whatever it is, as part of setup? I know. You know? I know. Or I don't know how that's going to Yeah, how do, I mean, would they literally, de you know, kind of down-tune the system so yeah. that it didn't take full advantage of the chip? That would be crazy. Yeah. Um, this is why people use Linux. This is also why we don't get nice things. <laughs> it doesn't. It does okay. sound a little hostile. <laughs> frankly, it, it really does. Yeah. I, I mean, there probably aren't isn't too big of an audience here. Yeah. You know. So why yeah. do it? I know. Right, why? You know, why do it? Yeah. Well, because um, does it okay. work for them to keep it working with these processors? I mean, I'm hoping to find some real good reason for this. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I think the reason is they want more money. I think oh. that's, well, the that's a good reason. They are. Uh, you know. They're, oh. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't anything particularly witty. They just wanted to get more money. No, I mean, that's me giving my interpretation of this. Okay, well, okay. but here's but the other... Only, but that's only half of the story. What's the... That is only half of the story. Okay, so there is also... Um, for people who do not have volume licenses um, who buy Windows 10 Pro right now, um, if you want to downgrade to Windows 7, you only can do that if you have rights passed on to you through your OEM. You know, if you have if you have a volume license, you can downgrade yeah. from Windows 10 to anything you want, right? It's like the the inheritor tax differs from state to state, so you have to it check does. with your local authorities. You're right. So if you're if you're a smaller, <laughs> mid-sized business and you don't have a volume license, you are going to care about this because there's this there's this edition called Windows 10 Pro Standard with downgrade rights, and Microsoft charges OEMs for this because they're trying not to let OEMs sell this, right? They don't want you, them to sell you this. So they're going to make that more expensive for the OEMs to try to discourage people from downgrading from Windows 10 to Windows 7 or 8.1. Um, so the price of Windows 10 standard with downgrade rights, which some people want for work machines so that they can go back to Windows 7, is going to jump by 30 bucks also um, from $135 to $165. So if you're a business and you want to downgrade from Windows 10 and you don't have a volume license, you're going to have to pay $30 more to do that. Um, it looks like starting November 1st. I spend entire days just muttering and walking around the house, shaking my head <laughs> because of stuff like this. I know. These are hard things to explain. This is why, you know, there are companies like Directions on Microsoft and people who do enterprise licensing as a, as a whole business, because this yeah. is really hard to explain and parse. But the bottom line is Microsoft is increasing the prices that it's charging OEMs for at least those two editions of Windows 10. Um, and the starting, reason they're doing it is because they want more money. I believe so. <laughs> I don't, it's not I don't the official I reason. I would give anything to see that on a fact. Yeah. But yeah. why are you increasing the price <laughs> well, on the downgrade rates? Well, we are doing it because we want more money. Shareholder value. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it, you know, it is shareholder value, right? Because you're, they're looking for ways to monetize Windows and to get fewer people to stay on Windows 7 and go to 10. So, yes. Shareholder value is, <laughs> in this country, that's okay. 
That's uh, that's yeah. our religion. Right. Shareholder right. value. So um, again, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to talk about any of this. Probably not, because this is kind of you know prices to OEMs, not something you're supposed to talk about if you're. Maybe Microsoft. this is why Panos Panay is going to London soon. Probably Shareholder not. value. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's called Future Decoded, isn't Get that it? That guy in a plane. That's it's the new strategy. <laughs> uh, let's see. So uh, we are, as you said, going to be getting Redstone Four soon. Yep. And people are starting to look at it. And yep. there's something hidden in there. Yeah, Raphael found, as he does so often. Um, uh, a feature that Microsoft had previously disclosed, um, originally scheduled for the Fall Creators update, but now for the Spring update or the RS4 release, called, I think it's called Cloud Clipboard or something similar to that. And the notion here, again, is that when you do a copy-paste, instead of it being relegated just to that one device and there only being like one slot for something to copy, uh, it will work across devices, you know, part of that cross-mobile devices scheme that Microsoft is working on. Um so uh, the fact that it's in an RS4 build already hidden suggests very strongly they intend to release that as part of RS4. Um, there are some other features Microsoft had announced, remember, back at build in May, I think it was, uh, Timeline, which came up, I think, before on the show today. Um, what else? Is there other stuff? I feel like there's other stuff. Cloud Clipboard Timeline. Um, pick up where you left off. Yeah. All that. Yep, all that. yep, yep. yep. Um, yeah. yeah, so it looks like um, we had all kind of expected to see this happen in time for the fall. It's not obviously not going to happen unless they miraculously deliver half of it overnight. Um, but it is probably going to be an RS4. And so the, the fact that it's in there, it's kind of like my people. When Microsoft took my people out of RS2, um, Raphael looked at an early build of RS3, which is the fall creators update, and said, hey, actually, it's back. So that was an indication they were getting ready to make it happen for testers first and then the general populace, and they did. And so I think we can say they'll probably do that again with uh, Cloud Clipboard unless it gets, unless something horrible happens, I suppose. Um, I, uh, we are we got yesterday, Patch Tuesday uh, came in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm seeing on Neowin, I don't know how widespread this is, that some people are reporting BSODs. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can actually make this my enterprise tip if you guys okay like save it and explain this more. Yep. S oh, so there's an explanation. Yeah. Ooh, it involves see. DEFCON levels. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. I see. You're right. I should have looked at the notes ahead of time. Well, I just added it because I was thinking, oh, I should I should talk about this because oh, it's kind of All a right. big deal. Okay. Yep. Let's take a break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to uh, tell you all about why Microsoft is killing Surface in 2019. And <laughs> this yep. will Coming not die, right will it? This More good news die. for the Windows enthusiast <laughs> I don't, after the break. This will not die, despite yep. many uh, denials yep. across the board. Mm. Yep. Our show today brought to you by Casper. Oh, I got the new Casper mattress, by the way. I opened it last night. We got a video. I don't know if it's on the—I don't think it's on our— uh, our system yet, but I'll, I'll put it up soon. Um, Casper is, as you probably know if you listen to our shows by now, it's an online retailer of premium, really top flight, very good, state-of-the-art mattresses comparable to the, you know, the $8,000 mattress you'd buy in a mattress store. But because they sell directly to you, they sell over the internet, they take out this really predatory pricing that you get in mattress stores, and it's very affordable, a fraction of the cost of the mattress store. But just as good. They're revolution, revolutionizing the mattress industry by just eliminating resellers and showrooms and just selling directly to you. Now, I have the original Casper mattress. It's made of supportive memory foams. It gives you a sleep surface that magically, and it feels like magic, gives you just the right sink. It's soft, but, it the, but it's firm. It's soft and firm. I don't know, I don't know how to describe that. It get just the right bounce. It's breathable which is very nice. You don't ever want to be hot at night. And a breathe a, a cool mattress, and a lot of these other mattresses, uh, you're, it's like a blanket on top of you and below you. You don't want that. Casper mattress also smells great. Doesn't have, there's, you don't have, there's no period of airing it out. It's just fabulous. Long-lasting comfort and support. Now, I know, where you, I know what the catch is, and I know why you don't, you're going to say, but Leo, I know where the but Leo comes from. How can, I tr how can I buy this mattress if I can't lie on it first? They understand you really want to try it out, but truthfully, trying it out in a store is not the way to try out a mattress. Try it out in your home. 
And that's how it works. Casper offers free delivery, painless returns, and a 100-day trial period. So you try it for, one, or I should say, 100 nights, right? Lot, sleep on it for 100 nights. And if in night 99 you say, well, I gave it a... I gave it a three-month shot, but I don't like it. They'll come. They'll take it. They'll refund you every penny. This is so much better than lying on a bed in a shower. But I understand it requires a little bit of a leap of faith. So that's why I always tell you, that's I sleep on it. I love it. They just introduced the Casper Wave mattress. It's a, even a little bit higher level, but still so much less than the top-of-the-line mattresses. I, uh, I opened it up yesterday. Um, what I love about the Casper mattress is they come in very compact boxes. You because all the they put somehow they have some magic machine. I'd love to see this machine. It takes all the air out of it, and then you open it up and it goes and it fills up, and uh, so it goes from being a very tiny little thing into a, a full size mattress. We got a California King, and it's amazing. I'll, wait till I show you the video. It goes and it's suddenly a full size King. It's, they call it Natural Geometry Support System. It's got a new top layer. It is the most comfortable. I can't. It's so comfortable. Casper mattresses uphold the highest environmental production standards. They're made in the USA. Get a Casper mattress. You're going to save $50 towards your mattress purchase if you go to casper.com slash windows, letting them know you saw it right here. Casper.com slash windows. And uh, do use the promo code windows to get that $50 off. Some terms and conditions apply. It is, um, it's a miracle. And really... Uh, a lot of the reasons this works, like many of our direct-to-you sponsors, is it eliminates that middleman. And in the mattress business, those showrooms, whew, they have a big markup, big markup. Casper.com slash windows. Well, as long as you're getting rid of the Windows phone, why don't we just dump Surface entirely, huh? Let's just get rid of the whole... You can understand why people are thinking that. Uh, no, I can't. No. Why are they thinking that? Was this just a rumor? Where did this come from? It's worse than a rumor. It's like one guy using his psychological evaluation oh, of Satya Nadella why they should get on stage at his own company's event yeah. said, I believe <laughs> that this guy will kill this product line, and I think it's going to happen in 2019. And then, with the incredulous audience questioning this, they turn to some guy from Lenovo. This is in Europe, by the way, where all of the top executives of the PC maker work. <laughs> and he said... Um, Hey, what do, you, do you think that could happen? And the guy said, yeah, I think that could happen. He wishes it would then, happen. Yeah, he does, actually, because Lenovo's the one PC maker that has never forgiven Microsoft for service. Um, and they asked for a guy from Dell, and that guy was noncommittal, but we're going to throw him in the pro column because we're trying to build a case here that this is going to happen. And that was the entire story. That oh, was all it. of the rationale. <laughs> forget there it. There was no insider information, no channel information, no nothing. It was just complete baloney. Oh. So I wrote that this was fake news. And, uh, you know, Microsoft is... Um, is Microsoft. I mean, it, they they could cancel Surface at any time, I guess, but uh, it is a billion-dollar business. I don't really see them doing it. It's successful. I I, I don't see the rationale for it, uh, personally. All right. Uh, but Microsoft did finally come out, uh, sort of, and say that they were not killing He Surface. said it's a, Panos Panay said it's a tabloid rumor of the week. So far from the truth. <laughs> yeah, and at least he didn't say it on Twitter. So, um, and I could see Panos. I mean, Panos is the guy who brings these things out and goes, "We put our love and heart and soul into it. It's the greatest thing ever." I mean, he really means it too. Yeah. And uh, I could, he would be insulted by that, wouldn't he? So, yeah, and, and uh, Panos is going to be on stage in London when I don't remember the date, but soon. Um, the very end of October. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, assuming that's the next time he appears live, I, I, I sort of expect him to kind of address this, maybe even jokingly. Um, but yeah, so far. Anyway, he has it come out. Um, yeah, he has. He hasn't really, you, you know, Microsoft is the way they often respond to um, rumors like this is they just don't respond. Yeah, which I don't like, by the way. Yeah, I feel like you need to address this stuff. You know, the Consumer Reports thing, they kind of came out publicly and yeah. were like, look, there's the deal. And yeah. they didn't really have much of a response to the reliability stuff other than to say, we feel like it's gotten better since the new products have come out, which, you know, could or could not be true. We don't really know. But uh, And then they used the customer service data, which is absolutely true, right? I mean, the customers uh, who stick with Surface love Surface. I mean, it's... Yeah. I've had so many problems with my Surface, but it's still... Uh, probably my favorite laptop of all time. Like, I still love the thing, even though, you know, I did have issues with it. All right. So, okay. So that was just bogus. Yep. And, uh, 
Yeah, I can understand why they wouldn't want to dignify it. It's like, come on. Yeah. Come right. on. But the problem is it was reported everywhere. Yeah. And you know how the, know. the web works these days. It's not like report colon or idiot analyst colon. It's Microsoft will cancel Surface. And oh, by the way, we, we know the exact date for some reason. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if this hadn't happened right after the Windows Phone being killed and the Groove Music Pass being killed, I think it would have had less uh, believability. <laughs> I think I think people were just like, oh, and what else are they going to kill? Oh, yeah. Okay. People, yeah. Surface. People, sure. People, why not? What's next? Right? Windows? <laughs> they kill Windows, Jerick. The last thing yeah. I care about. Yeah. 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 Well, and by all reports, they're making money on Surface, right? Yeah, they are. Yeah. They, well, we don't know how much money they're losing, right? Uh, we don't know if it's... A, right. By which we mean, yes, they're making money. They're making money because they're not losing as much money as you thought. Right. But no, do we know if Surface is profitable? No, we don't. No. That's true. We know they're selling... We know it's an over billion, around billion dollar a quarter business, right? But we don't know how much they're spending to make the billion. That is fair. So, yeah. Why don't they have to report that? Leo, I asked myself. Isn't and that actually, material? I, I mean, to an investor, isn't that material? I think so. I, I think so. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand how they can be so vague. It's not even uh, vague is, is the wrong word. If they were it's consistently. Not just that. Apple does that too. I mean, I don't understand why. Uh, Aren't you Apple supposed says to tell people, investors what's people. going on? I mean, isn't that the whole point of. Public company? Yeah, you would think so. Uh, I thought so. But I, of course, I'm naive when it comes to this stuff. But um, I. I, Mary Jesna, I complain every single quarter. We have a conversation where we were we're both scanning the same documents just as they're released for the quarter release results, and I'll and she can I can she probably has her spine tingling because she knows I'm about to ping her and be like, why the hell have they not provided? Because they'll <laughs> we'll look at like uh, eight quarters in a row, five of them they will have mentioned some Office 365 commercial, you yeah. you know, uh, active users per month, three of them. They don't, and it makes it impossible to do year over year, month over just, you know quarter. I just, I we gotta get some financial. I gotta talk I know, to somebody because it's, cra it's I, crazy. It's, it was it's my and again I'm like you, my, uh, Paul. I'm simplistic about this. Well, I'm not yep. completely simplistic, but <laughs> I kind of understand how this works. Simple when you're a best. public company. You ask right. people to invest in you. Yes. In order to do that, certainly before you go public, you go around and you tell people all the material information. They look at your balance sheets, all this stuff, to see if you're a good investment. And then you continue as a public company to do quarterly reports, to do an annual report, to do calls to explain why yep. your company may or may not do it well. Yep. And you would yeah, think no, this they is are very material to an investor. They are literally tailoring the information they provide to to, oh, to for it to be as positive as possible, rather than for it to be as re realistic or real world or whatever you want to say yeah, as it's possible. It's not a PR I, thing. This is so investors can decide whether yep. your stock is worth right. buying. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This yeah, is but exactly in, my complaint. All, every company does it. Number one. Um, I number two. I don't understand why they get away with it. I know. I and, you know, Steve, Steve Ballmer, who happens to be the biggest shareholder in Microsoft, um, has said multiple times, like, I can't believe Microsoft doesn't even disclose what percentage of their cloud business is Azure. Right. They don't. Well, excuse me, but I know Steve <laughs> Ballmer knows. That's the <laughs> he point. Doesn't. He wants He wants to know. Oh, he, he knows. Know. You think he doesn't he, know? You think they don't tell him? I think him? he doesn't know. Yeah, I, I don't think he knows because well, he said I'd be this pissed. publicly. I'd go to the I go to the shareholders <laughs> meeting and say, "Damn it, you need to tell us this. This is material to whether we invest yeah. in you. Whether my exactly. bomber's got a lot of money invested in my I know. dishonest. Oh, it, it's, he it's, does. it's dishonest, and if it isn't, it should be illegal. I, I, I it makes no sense to me. Yeah, and you know what? What Microsoft has done is they've re rejiggered regularly how they report their financials. They put more and more things together in buckets that make it impossible to pull these things out. Right, so. <laughs> It, like things are reported together that you're kind of like, huh, why are those things being reported well, together? I'm sure well, just, as, just as it is with the tax laws, they go yeah. right up to the edge of what they can legally yeah, get away they with. Do. Sure. I mean, they have a building full of lawyers, so they know exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how to parse right. it. I'm right. sure it's legal, but yeah. my question is the why it's not legal. I know. Uh, and the one part we did know how it was doing because they wanted people to see why they were getting out of the business was Windows Phone. They kept reporting how much money they were losing every quarter on Windows Phone. It was really Phone. transparent. <laughs> it's almost like people shouldn't have been surprised. 
I know. You know, because they yeah. did this for two years straight. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we can complain all we want, but I don't think it's going to change. They seem to know how to well, do this. Well, I feel like Congress <laughs> has other things, other fish to fry that are probably Yeah, they, they have some bigger things going on. <laughs> it does seem odd, and, it, and it's one of the reasons I don't buy stocks. Yeah, listen, I complain. I, I complain about this every quarter, every single quarter. It's like a, it, it's an automatic thing because the the information they disclose is it is so slapdash and so nonsensical, it makes me crazy every time. I would and then use you go back word. I would quarter. use the word self serving. It's it's, it's self it's illegal. It's it, it is cherry picking facts. Is that's what totalitarian governments do? You you don't you. This is should be illegal. In, in well, for a I'm publicly a, owned company, I, I'm it not a Microsoft be, shareholder, but uh, if I were, I would. See, I, I don't. Why aren't you guys demanding this information? I yes, <laughs> shouldn't that, you? That's fair. Yeah. Why isn't I Balmer, I'm not, I'm, like? I mean, yeah, that's yeah. why I feel like Balmer must know. Of course, if Balmer knew, then that would really be an uneven playing field because some insiders <laughs> would know. Gonna, like you're such an idiot. You don't know anything about finances, and you don't know anything <laughs> about investing, and you don't, you know. And yeah, okay, fair enough. I'm, you know. Well, I know I'm just a little a bit about it. Pennsylvania stay, farmer boy. All I'm it. saying is, Mr. Emmaus. <laughs> Mr. Emmaus, I like that. <laughs> or as Cena called me yesterday, Mr. Man. You think you know everything, Mr. Man? What's that county? What's that county you live in? <laughs> Lehigh Valley. South, oh, right. South Lehigh Valley. Upper Lehigh. Upper Lehigh. Upper Lehigh. Upper Macungie. Lower? Upper Macungie Valley. <laughs> oh, it's not. The lower Macungie Valley. <laughs> Truth is, Leo, I still have no idea where I live. The, all of those names are roughly <laughs> accurate. I don't know. Uh, it's kind of over the river and through the woods, literally. I don't know. Uh, I, you know, it feel it feels like it is uh, taking advantage of uh, of, of investors, and uh, but you know, after all, aren't the laws in this country written to benefit companies, not investors? So, oh, they're people, Leo. They deserve rights. I think they do. <laughs> I think they do. They deserve rights. Oh boy, they mm -hmm. deserve the right to tell us the truth. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm sorry. You need a gong, oh. Mary Joe, but now it's me and I did. Paul. I kind of needed one. I was just sitting here thinking, wow, I wish I had my gong right now. I have never loved you more than I do right now, Leo. <laughs> uh, let's, I, couldn't let's, I couldn't agree with you more. One thing about the Arrow Launcher, front and center, it's got a nice big Cortana button. <laughs> Does it have a Microsoft st stock quote thing right there? Yeah, the well, that'd be, they should have a little stock ticker going across. <laughs> How much money we're making on Surface right here. Look at that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell you that. Surface growth was double that it was three months ago. If we only knew, yeah. if we only okay. knew, we'd tell you. Let me oh. see. Hey, Cortana. <laughs> How much money does Mike? Hap What's happening? What's happening? Is I don't know. Something, something just started auto playing in my browser. <laughs> oh, there's another. You got a horrified look on her face there's there. I, thought I was like, "What's happening?" <laughs> wait, wait, I even have a funny. blocker for that auto play. Take thing. some of the paper towels out of the thing you're using to hold up your uh, webcam and, and clean your eyes there. You okay? <laughs> yeah. Like, jeez. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I didn't hear it. We didn't hear it. Only you heard it. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> what is invoke? Is that an event? <laughs> is that a thing? What is awesome. it? What is the, Oh, this is is that the Harman Kardon speaker? It is. Yeah. Third guess. Yep, you are correct. It's pretty uh, good actually. Yeah. So, uh Harman Kardon is making a Cortana speaker. We knew that. We knew it's coming out this fall. Um, we didn't know a lot of other things about it, but we now know many things because Microsoft accidentally published to their own store website everything about the invoke <laughs> and now, they've removed it. <laughs> now they've removed all this information but um we found out a lot of good things we found out that um it's going to cost uh 199.95 i believe at least that's what it looks like it's going to cost right um that's what the, yeah that's what the page said that's what the page said. Uh, but it comes in two fun colors. I know. We didn't know that, right? We knew it was going to come in black, which they're calling graphite. And it's also coming in pearl silver. Um, or call it gray. Yep. Yeah, gray or silver, That's maybe. Black and white. Okay, uh, good. Right. Yep. <laughs> Stunning uh, new colors. Right. Um, we also know that it is going to be out apparently on October 22nd because that was on the page also. And we know it weighs 2.3 pounds. We, we know a lot of things now. Um, Some very specific about, details. 
We know it yeah. takes a uh, 220 watt uh, or 20. So how long before Microsoft kills this business? Yep. Because uh, I tell well, you what, okay. they're going into a buzzsaw here. They now. Yeah, they it's funny that you said that because Brad, uh, it, when the day this happened, he tweeted. He says, um, "I think Carmen or Harmon Carden had." confirmed to him that they will release a speaker on October 22nd. And my response to him was, did they tell you when they're just going to discontinue it? <laughs> we had the same because, reaction. Because yeah, not only are you know, going against the incumbent Amazon, which is everywhere and has form factors for any as far conceivable as the crevice. Yep. Uh, and then, um, then, of course, Google has now launched its yep. Google yep. Home yeah, Mini, Leo, Midi, and um, Maxi. The Invoke has one major advantage over these other products. <laughs> what is that? Uh, what it's is that? more expensive. No, actually, that, 200 bucks is kind of right in the middle of all of this, right? Yeah. No, but for the type of thing it is, what no, this goes against... No, you can get a Google, the, the you can get that Google Donut or the or the Amazon Dot for like 40 bucks, so you're yeah. right. Yeah. Right. But if, if you want to compare it to a mainstream Google Home, it's $129, I think. The yeah. uh, Amazon Echo was actually more expensive. I think it was about 179 for a while, but I believe it's less expensive than that today. Anyway, it's more expensive than both of them, so smart. And you... You know what I was most surprised about wasn't the price though. It they they um, I was wondering if they were going to position this as a business device because when they did their recent uh, partnership with Amazon around Alexa and Cortana being able to collaborate, they both made a big deal out of the fact that Cortana is better at handling your business kinds of activities, like your you know knowing your business calendar, accessing your LinkedIn contacts, and all that. So I thought, oh, maybe you know what, maybe they're going to position this as a business device. They're yeah. not. They're going like head to head with the oh. Echo Google the, Home. The problem, the yeah. problem I have with this Apple is that it it, it provides yep. Microsoft with the same thing uh, that they do in the financial space, uh, except in a kind of a product bullet point sense. In other words, Microsoft can come up with a slide at some developer show and say, "Hey, uh, we have this digital assistant, and you can access this digital assistant on phones, which no one owns." Um, or on phones like iPhone and Android, which no one uses Cortana on. You can access it on PCs. You can access it on Xbox One. And you can access it on a new family of ambient devices all around your home. And technically, it's true. You could. But the thing is, no one is actually doing that thing, right? And so just like UWP for many years, one of the primary selling points was it's available on phone too. Yeah, technically. But nobody really ever bought those phones. And UWP has never taken off. And it, I feel like this is the same kind of thing. It's like... It's like a, it's a technically true. Yes, it exists, but no one's going to buy this thing, you know, and a couple of years later, yeah, I think I, it's not going to be around that long. It, it, it's, this is not something that is going to be successful. Do this companies no ever do that? I mean, do they ever look at the market and say, oh yeah, we don't have a chance. Well, look at the, I, ke <laughs> I kept thinking like the kin, right? Like Microsoft yeah. brought that to market and Four then months. boom, like, yep. yeah. Well, so, but that's, that, that was, there were, there were other circumstances around that, yeah. but. But it makes you wonder, like, okay, you guys saw what happens when that happens. Like, what if you bring out – I mean, it's not Microsoft's speaker, by the way. It's Harman Kardon's speaker. Yep, um, yep. But you bring this out, and then nobody buys it. So what do you do? Do you like – Well, you must have some it? idea. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I think some of us suspected for a little while, too, that maybe they would hedge their bets and, and put another assistant in there, right, that you could swap it out for Katana uh, or, may, or for a, Alexa or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I – it, this is a, this is tough. You know, Microsoft is kind of no. behind here, and I, it, it's kind of hard to understand on the client side where something like Cortana could ever hope to catch up to the Google no. Homes and Amazon Echoes of the world. Yeah, it's already a crowded race. That's the thing. If we're it just, is. if we're just Amazon and Google, okay, but but you also yeah. have Am, you also have uh, Apple marching in in a moment. Yep. Yeah, and they're, they're yeah. going to have part of the market, whether you like it or not. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how unsophisticated or sophisticated it is. They're 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 going to own a chunk of it. Those people are very loyal, and it's a big base. Um, and Samsung's trying their hand with Bixby, which I no, frankly think is no. going to be just they're, as successful they're, as Cortana. They're, they're a non-starter, too. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's very much like, it reminds me a lot of Windows Phone, where That's you're right. marching into a, a market where there are two solid incumbents, and yep. you don't offer anything better or different. Right. Yeah. What was it's, the old rule? The old business rule it has to be ten times better than the, yep. than the incumbent if it's going to have a chance. I mean, not just a bit better; it has to be a lot better. And this, this is been at all. yeah. This has been my argument about the Google phones. Like, look, nobody 
Nobody cares about your products, guys. You need to price them better than this. You can't come in and just say we're on par with Apple, so we're going to charge the prices Apple does. You're not going to sell any of those well, devices. Well, even price and, wouldn't. I mean, it's, no, no, I know, I know. That's not the same thing. But I mean, you have to make a concession. You know, I, I used to say this uh, to Microsoft. You know, with the phones. I mean, look, you need to buy, give people an incentive to buy your products. Um, if they're not going to be better. You got to lower the price. Yeah. <laughs> like, now, now yeah. the chat room is saying, but what, wait a minute, they've got Xbox. Cortana's out there already with Xbox. Yeah, seriously? <laughs> how, all right. How many Xbox Ones are there in the world? Twenty-five million. Yeah. Twenty-five okay. million. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's compare that to the user base for PCs, which is uh, you know Windows 10 PCs, supposedly five hundred million. I would say it's probably close to five fifty. Probably more Xboxes out there than Echoes. Uh yes, I don't. I actually think Amazon's position is very temporary. By the way, so yeah, Google, how many Google Android Google phones are in there in the world that can run uh, in the Google Assistant? How many hundreds of millions? You know, uh, how many uh, iPhones are there out that can run uh, Siri? All of them. So hundreds of millions. Um, those are much bigger markets mm. or user bases or whatever. Right, and then the other the other um, worrisome piece of this, right, is the whole home automation part. I mean, we've seen that Cortana is starting to have home automation pieces added in for, I think it can work with Nest and um, forget what else. There's like four things, right? So they there's like four. four there's like four things. And so, so they work with all four <laughs> of the home automation products that are out there. That's great. Yeah. And uh, you know, how many, how many Alexa <laughs> skills are there for home automation already? Sure. Um, they control everything, right? And you don't have to be paying too much attention to this world to know that uh, Amazon, but also Google, most recently with their routines, which you know are basically like these batch files where you kind of put stuff together and you make a command like "good night," and right. the shades go down, the lights go off, the security system comes on, your alarm gets set, the bedtime story starts getting rid of the kid, you know, read to the kid in his room, and you know this whole yeah. series of things can kind of happen. And me, of course, my phone just kicked it and tried to turn off the lights. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it literally, literally, the the Google system, my phone said, it, this is what she said, to, or he, whatever it is, said, mm -hmm. sweet dreams in his little smiley face. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that cute? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Trying to, trying to, trying to remain positive, as I do. But I, I, just, I, just, I just don't see it. Yeah. This is a market that Google is going to have a hard time catching up with. Yeah. I mean, well, except, Amazon is 800 lengths ahead. Google has the know. horsepower to get there, yeah. but so they, even Google's going to have a hard time. The F, yeah, and and by the way, this is that's the thing. You could make the you could make the argument for Microsoft as you can for Google that this is central to their business aspirations. You know that being the AI behind the personal assistant that people use digitally is. Super important to these companies, right? I, I'm actually not 100% sure it's super important to Amazon, to be honest. Um, you know, if the if the Echo business disappeared today, you know, like whatever. I mean, I'm not sure that would be a huge thing for Amazon. No, I'm sure Amazon's plan B is, oh, well, we'll integrate it with Google Home. Because yep. really, this, the yep. shopping is what yeah, they care about. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they can put those skills on Google Home, yep. shopping stuff. It's fine. Yeah. I, I Microsoft has the brain power um what they i think lack is the delivery vehicle you know i think the beauty for google in this space is that they have the brain power like microsoft does they have the cloud-based ai machine learning whatever you want to call it stuff they also own the client you know and that's it's huge there's you know, a certain they're, they're, and in fact i, th I thought such and adela had this there's a certain discipline yeah. Yep, that's required. I I, and Steve Jobs always said that, that the that saying no was maybe the most important thing he could do. Not saying right, yes, but, but saying no. But what if an OEM comes to you and says, hey, we'll pay you to put your um, assistant on our speaker. You want to take our money? Yeah, but how much money could it be? I, exactly. How much I money is Harman? Harman Kardon, by the way, owned by Samsung. Yeah, uh, also weird. <laughs> yeah, a lot of little weird. Well, another is, reason this why this is a kind of who cares because yeah, yeah. it's really how strange. much effort are they going to put into it? They, they well, I'm but, sure you know, when they made the deal with Microsoft, they weren't owned by Samsung. Oh, that could be. Uh, so yeah, uh, that could be. Um, the other thing is, if if Harman Kardon exits, at least we'll have all of those other Cortana speakers to fall back on. Cricket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Strange. All right. I think we've beaten this one to death. 
Uh, I, you know, I want it to be good. I, I like, I would like to see there be even more competition in this speaker market and alternatives for people who do like using Cortana. But I worry, you, like, how long are they going to stay in? Do you Why like though? using like, Cortana? What? Are you like, do you wish? No, you could... I, I, I do not. I am not in that group. Yeah. Well, I wonder who is. That's yeah. the thing. Like, Windows Phone actually did have a value to it, and it did have advantages. It did have things that it did better than Android and iOS. Yeah. And there's still people today, even though it makes no sense now, latching on to some of those things yeah. um, and grasping them desperately. Uh, Cortana, I, you know, I, I can't say that the service itself has any advantages over the other assistants. Um, the one advantage, I suppose, is that it's built into Windows 10, which is the operating system I happen to use during the day. On PC. No, and, it, and it's built into many office applications now, right? So um, it's under the covers in some ways, but it's it lets you do certain things like ask about your calendar if you want to do that. Right? If I can right click on a word in Edge and find out a definition or learn more about it in a pane or something, that's useful. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't make me want to use Cortana somewhere else. You know, I just I don't like, I don't use voice uh, I don't use voice assistance at all because I am somebody who types even like on my phone I type questions into yeah my no, phone. I do this I do the same yeah I, yeah. yeah that's uh, old school again no it not is. old school old school right yeah we're okay. just old well I'm Let's not just saying Microsoft it. should kill Cortana <laughs> by any means in fact no they made no. a deal with Amazon it's in the it's no, going to be in the Echo here's right? the problem it's the same slow motion car crash all over again it's, it does feel that it, way it's hard watching Windows Phone happen again. Um, because again, you feel like they had something that was working. Yeah. It could have been great. They they're one of the few companies that can do this. <laughs> Excuse me. That was like in stereo for me. I got to hear <laughs> almost, it. Real I almost caught that, but <laughs> sorry guys, my fingers aren't fast <laughs> enough on the buttons. Uh, sorry. Uh, that was some grassy knoll stuff right there. So um, <laughs> Mary Jo was the lone shooter. Yeah. I, I think I saw smoke coming from over it's right Mary Joe's toilet paper rolls. Um, <laughs> whatever that is. I don't know. I just, I feel bad because I feel, you know, like I said, Microsoft's one of the few companies that can do this. They could do a great job at it. Um, I, this AI machine learning cloud-based stuff is a skill for them. It's just a, it's a huge thing. And uh, they just, but they're lacking. Yeah. They just don't have the client. On the bright penetrate. side. Uh Get it, Gar Guardians of the Galaxy uh, episode eight. They can say, "Hey, Cortana," and it'll be that's it'll right. be nostalgic. It'll be fun. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And then uh, a voice would just say, "I'm sorry, I don't understand <laughs> that." That would be the whole. Cortana's going to be in Skype, though, right? Yeah. What does that sure. mean? Yeah. How, what I can ask her to call. So, it's in the form of a bot. They actually. I want her to be the Skype lady. <laughs> instead yeah, of that well, weird. Actually, so there, by the way, there is okay. So there is some element of that. So. Um, uh, they announced this a long time ago, by the way. I, in fact, when they announced that this was available, I was like, wasn't this already a thing? I, I, but the, you could install, and now it's, it's just going to be there like a, a Sky, I'm sorry, a Cortana bot. And so you can explicitly have a conversation with Cortana through Skype, which to me is passingly useful. Um, the more um, sophisticated usage there is you're having a conversation with someone else. And you say, you know, I'm texting with Mary Jo, and I say, hey, let's go see a movie on Friday night. And then Cortana is going to pop up and say, you know, like Clippy. It looks like you're trying to see a movie on Friday night. Would you like me to help? Uh, um, yeah. And it's it's what it's going to do is use, um, I guess we'll call it machine learning or whatever, to sort of understand what it is you're saying and then pop up at times when it makes sense to do so, to help you out, to order a pizza, to look, you know, hey, what was the capital of Massachusetts again? Or what, you know, whatever the question might be, Cortana can spring up like a little specter at the bottom of your, you know, Skype window and help you out. I guess. Hooray. Hooray, hooray. Yeah, only in the U.S., though, so uh, <laughs> that was the other, the other like issue. Many, like many Cortana services. Yeah, I feel compelled to say that because I get complaints from yeah. everybody who lives outside of the United States. And by the way, I'm surprised to say it's a lot of people. Um, uh, they're, and they're getting a little tired of this. Um, yeah. Seems like a lot of stuff, especially for Microsoft, comes out U.S. only at first and sometimes stays there. So we'll see what happens. Uh, let's talk Office. Microsoft wants to have two thirds of its users in the cloud. Does that mean yes, subscribing, or does that mean like actually using right. what the does cloud that mean? Office? Please, what does that mean? I I have at least twice in a panicked form contacted Mary Jo about this story because I am 
<laughs> this is confusing. Tell, explain why this, first okay. of all. Okay. So the backstory of this is strange. Okay. Here's the backstory of this. So a month ago, Rajesh Jha, who is the head of Microsoft Office Applications, he's he, by the way, is a member of the senior le leadership team who you kind of never see in public. You never hear from him. You never see him. He um, was speaking at a Deutsche Bank uh, tel uh, conference, investor conference. I just saw the transcript of this by accident yesterday on the Microsoft Investor site. So it's a month old. Um, and I, I was like, oh, I wonder what he said. He never talks in public. He said to the people at the conference that Microsoft right now has 50% of its Office users in the cloud. So he's saying 50% of all Office users are on Office 365 already. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, excuse me. Is Are we sure that's what that means? Um, so... That is what he said. Okay. Because um, that doesn't seem possible. That, that, that's what he said, but that doesn't actually – I've never seen them say that before. Instead, what they did say during their last earnings call was more than 50% of our office revenues, revenues are now coming from Office 365. Yes, that I understand. But the, the right. problem is the user base thing is um, it's all the people over the years who bought Office, some version of Office, right. or got some version of Office with some PC or whatever it was, never yep. upgraded. And they still right. use Office 2013 or Office 2007 yep. or whatever the heck it might be. Yep. You know, revenues, of course, you would think, you know, new Office revenues or, or right. as we would call them, Office revenues every quarter. Yeah, over 50% of those will come from the cloud. Like, that makes sense to me. People aren't going right. to Best Buy buying a box with Office in it and bringing it home and installing right. it on their computer. Right. Um, well, I should also say, uh, limit. this is limited. He's talking about commercial Office users, so business Office users. Okay, no, that, that's, okay. that's good. Okay, so right, we so there's a number we never had heard. Fifty percent of all Office users are already using the cloud version of Office. The next thing he says to the group is, and by our fiscal 2019, which starts next year, it starts on July 1st, 2018. We think we'll have two thirds of our business Office customers using Office 365. That's a huge number and a huge jump right we don't yeah. know when we don't know when during fiscal 2019 but there's no way there is no way that's true there, i mean you know what i like that does why, why does that seem i mean uh, it seems very very well, fast okay. so and big in our well, previous why, why doesn't business want to use office 360 no 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 it's not it's not that they don't want to use it i i, I actually look I, this is inevitable uh, the truth is most businesses will be on office in the cloud versus say office what do they call it perpetual license perpetual license um, yeah of course uh, the thing is you know one of the things i've actually written about that's tied to the conversation we had earlier about the financial stuff is that microsoft will sporadically reveal how many monthly active users there are on office commercial and or on office uh, I, i'm sorry office 365 commercial versus mm -hmm. office 365 um, consumer they don't do it every quarter, like I said. This is actually the Office 365 thing is the thing I was specifically referring to. It's aggravating because you try, you're trying to track the progress of this thing, right? And so right. you can make a little chart that shows, like, oh, look, this thing's going up. And of course it's going up, you know. <laughs> um, we also had the conversation, you guys might recall, in the past where I was saying, you know, the number seems kind of small. I think it crossed 100 million at one point and went to like 100 and, 130 million. Does that sound right? Uh, the latest yeah, number. Yeah, around maybe. there. I think so. Yeah. And I said, you know, in, in back in the day, Microsoft used to always talk about uh, 1.5 billion Office users, and like 100 million, or 130 million, pick pick the number you want. Um, seems like really small compared to that. Like that, this Office 365, this notion of Office in the cloud, is maybe not as successful, at least not as quickly successful as maybe we had assumed in the past. But the thing that somebody, I'll just say, somebody from Microsoft reminded me about this was that. Those people represent ongoing revenues, right? This is not a one-time right. shot. Um, right. A customer doesn't pay Microsoft for Office 365 in 2016 and walk away and use that for five years. They come back and they pay for it again the next year. That's how it works. It's a subscription. So um, those 100-something million people, users, customers, whatever, are much more valuable to them than the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who acquired Office 7, 8, whatever years ago and are never going to buy it again. Um, they're different types of customers. So, uh, but still, you know, two thirds of Microsoft's revenues come from off, uh, from uh, business uh, commercial customers. That user base has to be humongous. I know. Right? right. So if the number really is 130, let's say it's 130. I'm, I'll just pull that one out. Um, 
You're, say, you're, you're not you. I mean, this guy from Microsoft is saying that by fiscal year 2019, which starts July 1st, 2018, which is only about nine months from now or whatever that works out to be, yep. suddenly two thirds of their entire office commercial user base, not revenues, right? Right. But he, he must be mixing it up. He I, mu he I wonder. Must, he must mean revenues. I, I, I just don't. So. I thought so, and I went back and looked at the transcript, and I'm like, hey, "Okay." Yeah, no, no. I, I, I obviously you yeah. obviously reported it correctly. I don't mean it like that. I mean, I mean the guy. Yeah. Like the, yeah. I, it just yeah. doesn't seem to make sense. Well, then he went on to say, "He, this is even another stat. You're kind of like, what? <laughs> um, Seventy. Microsoft expects seventy percent of its Exchange and Outlook users to be using the cloud." rather than on-premises versions of those products in fiscal 2019. Okay, 70% of exchange, right? And he said, um, we are running yeah. about a year ahead of where we thought we were going to be with this two years ago. Okay. Um, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't have any particular understanding of where that was. I, I, there there yeah. was an understanding for many years that email was the low-hanging fruit of cloud computing, that if you're going to get mm -hmm. businesses to go to the cloud, uh, email would be right. the first and most yeah. obvious but it, I actually think that yeah. perspective has changed since then. But okay, whatever. It, it's still a yeah. major workload. Yeah. I have, anyway, I do don't you, know that one. I don't. No, no one from Microsoft has contacted me since I posted this yesterday, <laughs> saying, "By the way, he was wrong. You know, he didn't mean to say yeah. that he meant revenues." So I think, I think this is they they are standing on this number as being a correct number. I. I. I no, so so the question <laughs> yeah. the, the question that many of us were debating on Twitter yesterday about this was, okay, how are they going to make this happen? Like, are they going to somehow change licensing or pricing or do something to try to push more people to the cloud, or do they just think the cloud momentum is so strong um, right. that it's just going to pick up? Let me do what I did with Microsoft Edge when I doubted those numbers, which is right. offer a possibility. Okay. Consider the average enterprise. Um, there's some combination of on-prem hybrid cloud services, right? They're very right. few of them are probably 100% in any, any one category. Um, right. Is it possible that when you say we're going to have two-thirds of our commercial customers, we're talking users essentially, on the cloud, it doesn't necessarily mean 100% in the cloud, right? That some piece of True. that enterprise will be in the cloud, right? Yeah. So in other right. words… Uh, I talked about low-hanging fruit. I would say the low-hanging fruit today is actually storage. And so maybe there are customers who do their own exchange, but they have one drive for business in the cloud. Right. Or they have some customers, I'm uh, sorry, right. some users on Office 365 Pro Plus. They have yeah. some that are not. But they're that's right. they're in the two-thirds because they're yeah. there in yeah. some capacity. Yeah, I bet I bet that could be one way they do okay. that for that, sure. That, that's the only thing that would make sense to me. Yeah, so the whole hybrid idea, like even if you even if you're somebody who has half your workloads in Exchange on prem, but half in the cloud, you still count as in the cloud, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So what I would slows buy. this down is that people have a perpetual license of Office, and there is no incentive whatsoever for them to change, right? Right. Well, until, until, well, well, and well, that's one thing. Like, why and, would know, I buy home. Office three sixty five? I've got light. I've got Office. You, you're uh, telling me there's yeah. something new in it that's I gotta have. Well, no. Yeah. Hey, Leo, they're, you're not describing an agile business for starters. Uh, <laughs> but I no, think they, if they're you gonna thought, start giving you. I was gonna say they're gonna stop giving you security patches for oh, Office. Like right, right now, to Office 2007, as of I think today, is no longer or so yesterday no longer getting any more security knows, patches. So he's there, there's data points he has you don't have. Which one is the curve? Yeah, the growth curve right, right now. Yep. But the right. other is what Microsoft might be doing to strong arm people who are using perpetual license. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. If, I mean, if, I, if it weren't for the perpetual license owners, sure. then you, if you were starting from scratch, you'd buy Office 365, right? Well, this is a yes, you would, of course. Yeah, I, I, this is the this is a very classic problem, right? You can claim this huge user base, which is a nice big number, 1.5 billion. Um, none of them are giving you any money anymore. Like this is money that's been spent. It's it's done. It's been accounted for. Um, there's only in this number. There's only a small percentage of rebuying office, you know. Right. Or you yeah. can have like a much smaller number, but they're paying you every single year, you know. And it, it, the one thing I do know about Microsoft and financials is that they love steady income. Like they prefer steady income over everything. Uh, the problem with the three-year Windows lifecycle wasn't that we were only able to add new features to Windows every three years. It's that we only got a big hit on yeah. revenues once every three years. You know what they want is a more even keel with fewer higher uh, valleys and peaks or whatever. Um, so Office 365 provides that. And in the long run, 
it's better for them to have us like, you know, whatever that is, one tenth the user base or whatever. And uh, but, per, you know, paying annually. Right. It's beautiful. Uh, that's what you want. That's sustainable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that's my guess. I just yeah, I, I was I so like confused by the story. I, I, I just it, it doesn't I like your guess. <laughs> yeah, it's the only thing that, it's the only thing that makes sense to me. Yeah. But anyway, the the takeaway for those listening from home is, uh, as I saw somebody tweet yesterday, if you're a partner or a customer and you're not thinking about cloud, it's time you think about the cloud. Oh, so Leo had asked, you know, why why are yeah. people not, you know, why would they not move to the cloud? Um, there are many yeah. reasons, right? Le- regulatory, right. you know, et cetera. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Also, uh, the people that run your exchange server, for example, um, you know, one of the tricky yeah. situations, you know, you come to your IT department, you're like, hey, I heard about this cloud thing. You think we should get on board with that? Um, they're going to say no because, you know, yeah. that's their job that's right now. Business, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and that's, right. uh, you know, yeah. that person is not necessarily very qualified to make <laughs> can, that can decision. Can you still you know? buy a perpetual license office? And you oh, yeah. can. And in fact, in the latter half of next year, towards the end of the year, there will be a new version of Office Perpetual. Oh, Leo, you might have missed this bit. Um, yeah, that's right. So Office 2019. Oh, yeah. We're going yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this is this is how I described Office 2019. They're, they're going to uh, bring you all of the features that Office 365 subscribers already have today, but they're going to do it next fall. <laughs> so I call it uh, yeah. yesterday's Office Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, yeah. That sounds about right. See, that's why I like yeah. the subscription. I know why Microsoft likes the subscription. It's an annuity yeah. for yep. them. But yep. I do understand why some why people don't want data in the cloud. There's lots of reasons right. for that. There are. Yep. Uh, well, this, that's but that's part of European it. Right? In other words, you know, thing, the GDP, we can GDP. talk like products like, um, yeah, sorry, uh, the um, Exchange or uh, OneDrive for Business. But those products contain data, right? So, you know, moving email to the cloud sounds great, but if that means that your data is going to be in the cloud and, reg- you know, from a regulation standpoint, you can't do that, then you're, that's kind of a non-starter. Yeah. You know, uh, all right, well, we'll move on from that. That's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting, he, he probably just misspoke, right? I mean, come on. Oh, like, like, I, yeah, Who like is I said, he? I don't, is he just some yeah. guy? He's some sales guy. No, right? he's, no, no, no. Oh. He is um, one of the senior leadership team guys. Oh, well, he knows that. He goes in those meetings every week. He, they, I don't believe the guy misspoke. Or if he did, I think they would have cleaned that transcript up really quickly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because, right. That's right. And For it may be like their right. quarterly <laughs> reports. It may There may have yeah. some fudge factors in there. It may be, yeah. as you guys suspected. It, yeah, it's it's very intriguing. They threw these numbers out there because, like yeah. Paul said, they they haven't been throwing a lot of numbers out well, there. Well, so. it's aspirational. It's not like somebody's going to hold their yeah. feet to the fire if they if they're wrong and say, "Well, well we really thought that would happen." They but might. He was, wasn't he speaking? It was basically to investors, right? Oh man, yeah, he was. Yeah. Well, Mike, you know, if fiscal twenty nineteen comes and you haven't met this target, I mean. You've remind just sent me a really bad never message. to have an initial public offering. I I, <laughs> I know, just right? Remind no me, kidding. Sure. Yep. I don't not to go public. I'm just going to stay right sure. here in private. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, let's talk about. I was very excited when I read an OnTex article on the new eighth generation Intel processors. There's a sentence. Yeah. There's a sentence that sounds like a geek. Uh, because <laughs> it it's the first time we're going to see a, a kind of a generic desktop processor with with six cores. 12 it threads. is cool yeah it's gonna be fast there's, there's a lot of misconceptions around this um generation because intel has completely screwed it up um so yes with the mobile processors that came out first it's really just cabby like processors uh, in quad core form no, which by the way coffee lake is the is the new no one. no but no, yeah. that's but the for the eighth gen the the mobile processors are actually cabby lake gen i know technology yeah when you move forward to the coffee lake uh processors which are for the desktop which were just announced uh, same thing, uh, same sort of benefit. Um, you, in this case, you go from four to six cores instead of from two to four. Um, for certain work, you know, uh, multi-core type workloads, gaming, obviously, but video rendering, whatever. Uh, massive benefits, you know, for day-to-day use, not so much. Um, but it is uh, architecturally actually not a new generation. Um, the difference is in this case, they require a new um, plug on the motherboard so it's not backwards compatible nor are the other ones it's the same compatible. socket it's different wiring which really yeah. is weird which yeah. is part of the reason i think they changed the name you know whatever yeah. but the but the really goofy part about this is going to come in the future because there's a coming generation of and i forgot the the code name for this thing um 
of processors that will actually be in the next generation. Uh, but they're going to market them as eighth. Oh, it's Canon Link, and they're going to they're going to market those as eighth generation core processors oh, too. For some reason, oh. I actually think they're going to change their <laughs> mind when that time comes. Right? Yeah, it's already uh, it's way also, too confusing. It's terrible. And there's some Atom slash Pentium chips coming as well, which will be marketed as 8th gen, whatever. But anyway, I guess the point is, it doesn't. let's not worry about the marketing stuff. Um, if you're a gamer or a video editor, or you, you need these kinds of processors, they just got way, way better. And that's true on laptops, and it's true on desktops. And so on laptops, uh, those parts are actually very hard to come by. Intel uh, is really trying to push them uh, so they've not raised the prices, which is amazing. And so if you buy a next generation, you know, Lenovo X1 Carbon or, a, um, you know, whatever the top end HP is, whatever the top end Dell is, presumably whatever the top end um, Microsoft Surface device is, you, you can get this quad core chip. It's actually a big deal um, for certain workloads. And same thing on the desktop. Yeah. This is going to, this is going to be a big deal. Yeah. This yep. is because really they were at, they're almost at the limits in terms of process. I think they're still, uh, this is a 10 nanometer or 15. I, I think it's still 15. No, it's 14. Um, 14, I mean, yeah. It's 14. But I was talking, I talked to someone about this and they were telling me that, you know, I, cause I kept, I was saying, you know, Intel has kind of put off going to 10 nanometers so many times they were supposed to do it. And, uh, the suggestion was that, you know, this stuff is actually a little more complicated than that, and that Intel's 14 nanometer process is, in almost always, more sophisticated than a 10 nanometer uh, process from a competitor. Anyway, so they're they're already getting like incredibly incredible efficiency and performance out of a 14 nanometer part. It's like it's kind of a why on earth would you change this if you didn't have to? There's no gigantic benefit to it. And clock speeds haven't really changed much. Over of several generations, but putting yeah. in putting in fifty percent more cores does make a difference. Where when you have a multi-threaded application, and I I'm guessing you maybe know know this better that because quad core and even dual core processors are kind of the mainstream now. I would imagine if you're writing software, you're you're making it multi-threaded, right? I mean, I I'm sure well, Office is not, <laughs> but. Well, like, you know, I, by the way, it probably is in some ways. Like uh, Excel probably does things. Yeah, to, yeah. Know, recalc probably. in Excel should be faster, yeah. Yeah. Um, but those, yeah, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of new software being written today, you know, for PCs that isn't games, right? And so uh, things like Photoshop will be up, you know, have already been updated to yeah, support this kind of thing. they take advantage of it for sure. Yeah. Lightroom will do it. Um, I'm sure, you know, various 3D packages, et cetera. But, um, yeah, it's it's kind of like, it's we used gaming. to think it was work, it's for gaming, gaming, right, yeah. and workstation type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right, let's take a break. Pick back of the back of the book coming up, including a fix for the BSOD from the big person on campus, Mary Jo Foley. But first, <laughs> a word from big word. Big person on campus. Big person. The, well, big what do you, person on Cooney campus. Yeah. Yeah, she's the. Well, it used to be BMOC, but that's uh, that goes back to the 50s. It's the yeah. big Mary Jo on campus. The big, M big MJF on campus. Oh, I like it. I like it. She's got a tip for <laughs> us in a second. But first, a word from WordPress, my my blog host. I love WordPress. You can see what I do with WordPress. I love it. It's at leolaporte.com. I was a uh, WordPress fan for years. In fact, I, uh, I, for many years in the 2000s, ran a self-hosted WordPress blog. But I've moved it all to WordPress.com now. They do the hosting. And by the way, very affordably, less than it costs to, for me to have my own host plus the time it took for me to maintain my server. I don't have to do it anymore. They do all the work. They keep the security patches up to date. Uh, with my business plan, I get all the plugins I got before. I'm using the, as an example, the Google AMP plugin to speed up my uh, page loads on mobile. I use their fabulous uh, Akismet anti-spam plugins. Actually, WordPress commenting. For a long time, I used third-party commenting. WordPress commenting is the best, best in class. It's fantastic. It's just a great platform. No wonder 28% of the internet, 28% runs on WordPress. That's huge. Now, if you're a business, and I, this, I see a trend in business that drives me nuts. More and more, and it's small business people. But I'll call a, a handyman, a plumber, I'll call a restaurant or whatever, and I want to know more about them. And I go to the web, and they say, go to my Facebook page or go to my Twitter account. That is terrible. You don't control that. Facebook does. Twitter does. You could be pulled off in a minute. 
you and and many of your users that's not they want to see your site so i understand why most small businesses don't have their own websites they say well i, I can't afford that i don't i don't have time to spend on running a site and i can't afford to hire a consultant you don't need to trust me just go right now to wordpress.com slash windows and just start your site you'll get 15 percent off just because you went there 15 percent off at wordpress.com slash windows Pick a template and start putting stuff in. It's easy to change templates. They have hundreds of them. They're gorgeous. Uh, I just was visiting Andy Anako's site. He uses a new template that I really like. I have a grid template. They have all of this, you know, fancy uh, stuff that, well, you know, a lot of high-end publications run on WordPress. Quartz, uh, which everybody raved about when Quartz came out. Man, this is modern, state-of-the-art. Wow, this is an incredible design. It was WordPress. So you're getting state-of-the-art design for your business. You're putting yourself online, which means your customers can know more about you. It's a platform so they can share about you. It's very easy. They can talk about you on their LinkedIn, their Twitter, their Facebook. So you get all of that automatically. Built-in search engine optimization. Uh, it's just fantastic. Come see why 28% of all the websites, including mine, run on WordPress. The words, world's most popular and most powerful site building platform. I don't even like to call it a site building platform. It's your new home on the net. You even you even get a domain name from them if you want. Go to wordpress.com slash windows and 15% off any new plan purchase. Create your website. Tell the world I'm here. We got it. We got a business. You want to try. It's the best way to do it. WordPress.com slash windows. We thank them for their support and for all those years of running Leoville. My blog. Paul Therott, Mary Jo Foley, we're talking Windows, and, and we're in the back of the book section of this fine show now, which means we go to mm -hmm. Paul Therott for his tip of the week. So if you are on the Windows Insider program, and a lot of you probably are, I would imagine, um, you should know that we are now in what I call the magic window, Ooh. which is that wonderful time period between the completion of one version of Windows 10 and the start of development of another. Now, in this case, of course, they've already started the development of the next one. But if you're on the fast ring, actually, or the slow ring or the release preview ring of the Windows Insider program on, on any given PC, you're in the RS3 train right now. But because that version of Windows has been completed and you have that final version of Windows already, you can right now quit the Insider program, remove the Windows Insider bits from your computer. You can leave the system uh, and you, you can go back onto the general available train, for lack of a better term, without any repercussions. In other words, if you tried to do this two weeks ago or two weeks from now, you'd actually have to reset your computer to get back to the, the normal current version of Windows. Um, it's just that period of time where the development version of Windows lines up with the shipping version of Windows. Now, that's going to change because tomorrow or the next day or sometime next week, Donna Sakar is going to release the first version of RS4, the next version of Windows 10, to the fast ring. And when that thing becomes available, you can no longer leave. You can only upgrade to that next version. Um, so if you want to get off the train for a little while, if you want to stay on RS3 for now, experience the normal update schedule and so forth, and maybe not worry about... Uh, the first couple of months, which is you know not a bad idea, frankly, because whenever any new version of Windows starts up, uh, it's uh, a little disruptive, you know, uh, in the beginning. This is the time to do so. The problem is, by the time you hear this, that window might have already closed, because like I said, it could close at any time. So it's one of those things. I I wrote about this the other day. Someone on Twitter said, "Well, can, should, can I wait until Monday, or can I wait until?" I was like, "Dude, you're either going to leave or you're not going to leave, because you might wake up tomorrow and the new builds out, and then you can't leave." So if you want to do it. Now's the time to do it. Unless, of course, you're listening to this later, in which case that time has already passed. Uh, <laughs> it's a short window. It's yeah. a tiny window. It's, it's a short, well, it's a short window of indeterminate length, Yeah, which is the problem. I did that last, um, uh, last time around. And yep. I, was I did it with happy. all my systems yeah. because actually I'm working on the book, right? Lock so I'm upgrading yeah. the book. I need the system to stay on this system. I can't go to RS4 right now because I need right. to make sure I'm on RS3. Right. Um, so I've actually done it everywhere. The other thing... <laughs> I screw up my computer completely. Um, I don't know what that just happened. Uh, all right, so as far as the uh, software pick of the week uh, is Outlook Mobile on iOS and Android was just updated with some major updates related to the calendar. Um, this is pretty exciting for people who are waiting for this stuff because, you know, with Outlook Mobile, there's always like a couple of things that people can't use it for whatever reason. And so 
Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in here, but the two big ones are sh are synced shared calendars, meaning that uh, people on Office 365 and Outlook.com um, can now share from within the app. Uh, they don't have to go up to the web to do that. They can handle uh, sharing invitations, uh, share calendars from the app, et cetera, which is very good. The other one's kind of, it's kind of a weird little footnote, but I, I, I've received many messages from people who think this is the biggest thing in the world. Um, on iOS only right now, it's coming to Android soon. You can now add a message when you're responding to a meeting invite, which of course is something you can do on basically all of the other Outlook clients. And so, um, I think everyone kind of understands like Outlook Mobile was something that came from Accompli, I think, and it was its own app. It was a separate app. Uh, Microsoft has turned it into Outlook, and they've been busy kind of cross-pollinating features because there's some really cool stuff in Outlook on mobile uh, that's going to move into Outlook on other platforms. But there's also these crucial Outlook features that we've been using for many, many years in the Windows space, and they're kind of making their way. Uh, to the mobile one. So the ability to add a message when responding to a meeting invite, I know it sounds like a little thing, but it's actually kind of a huge deal. Um, you want to say, yes, I can come, and then here's a note because, you know, whatever the note might be. So that's kind of cool. Should I, um, is it, I mean, I, I'm really all Google. I use Google Calendar and Google Mail. Is it okay yeah. for that? Yeah, you can use it with uh, Google accounts. Um, you don't get all of the feet. Like for example, does that feature work on? Probably not. That's an, it might be an exchange. Calendar. Feature. Certainly not. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. probably an exchange slash Office three sixty uh, Outlook dot com feature. But right. um, they do work. I mean, I you know, depending on your mindset, the Outlook mobile stuff is either the greatest thing that's ever been invented or the greatest atrocity that mankind has ever been foisted with. But like, it's. Not like other mobile apps in the sense that it has a lot of stuff in it, you know, mail, contacts, calendar, to-dos, and then it integrates with all kinds of other things, including like online storage systems. You can do everything from uh, one app. You know, it's kind of not the mobile way of doing things. But for guys who came uh, from the Windows world where Outlook does most of those things in one app too, it's like, yeah, nice. This is what I want. Um, so it just, it kind of depends. It does work pretty well with the um, the Google stuff, but you're obviously you're going to get the big... Um, the biggest benefit if you're in the Microsoft space. Yeah, it does support uh, Yahoo, iCloud, Google, and IMAP. I'm looking at it right now. So yeah, it's just a question of whether it supports it fully for all these new features. Right. You know. The no, I I could believe it wouldn't. Yeah. Yes, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. Uh, I guess that takes us to the long-awaited enterprise pick of the week with Mary Jo Foley. Yes, so we've been hearing um, there have been some problems with one of the patches that Microsoft released this week on Patch Tuesday. If you're on build Windows 10 1703, the original creator's update, um, and, and or Windows Server 2016, there were two patches that went out. One was KB404. 1676 for Windows 10 and KB4041691 for Windows Server. People who applied these patches uh, started reporting today that they were having blue screens of death, um, their machines were hanging, there were a lot of really bad things going on. Um, and then there were just kind of random posts showing up in Microsoft's forums like, hey, what's going on? It seems like these patches are bad. Uh, it sounds to me, based on some people I'm talking to here, that this has to do with Microsoft accidentally applying both the Delta update and the cumulative updates um, on a machine together. So if that is true, that means either it, sh it should mean only business customers will be affected uh, because if, if this is right, Windows 10 Delta and cumulative updates were both published to Windows Server Update Services, WSUS, and System Center Configuration Manager, that is a situation that should not happen. <laughs> mm. And when it happened, um, it started causing people to blue screen. The reason I'm saying it should be only a business thing is, you know, co consumers don't use WSUS. Um, they use Microsoft Update typically for their automatic updates. So the advice seems to be right now, if you are somebody who is affected by this, you and you're an, a systems administrator, you should resynchronize your WSUS SCCM server and the Delta update binaries will just go away. So it, not a good situation today if you were somebody who automatically applied these patches as soon as they came out this week. Okay. Yeah. 
sorry, but sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it seems like there is a fix and ha you have to resynchronize. There's, there seems to be some information. I'm looking at um, Taro Alhonen, who listens to our show a lot. Um, he's got a link in his Twitter account to something on docs.microsoft.com that is explaining that Delta and Cumulative Updates are inadvertently both being installed so your computer will no longer boot and here are the steps you can do to recover yeah because i had no problems on any of my machines and then yeah, people who so had problems either. said like it happened to all my machines now, i know that makes right. sense yeah. now hey guys yeah yes um i apologize for interrupting i just uh, my wife just texted me and reminded me i actually have to go okay <laughs> so well I, I, let's I open a beer uh, let's open a beer i have a bus to make so i'm gonna just go, go but, um, goodbye goodbye right. paul okay Sorry. We're going to open a beer in your name, Paul. We will. We will. Okay. See you later. <laughs> All right. I guess that means you and me. Uh-oh. There you go. I turned you off. You okay? Instead of Paul. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Ta-ta. Uh, so, yeah, beer pick of the week. <laughs> it means more Let's for us, pick. Mary Jo. <laughs> it does. It does. And I think, Leo, you would probably like this beer I'm picking. It looks really good. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> So Firestone Walker Brewing in Paso Robles uh, makes some amazing dark beers, especially stouts uh, and porters. They have a very famous uh, oatmeal stout that's called Firestone Walker Merlin, and it's really widely available in the United States. They have now taken that and, and done a derivative that's called Mocha Merlin, Firestone Walker Mocha Merlin. So they take this oatmeal stout, they add coffee, they add some uh, lactose sugar to it, and wow. mix it all together, and it tastes like a mocha. <gasps> I want it. It really does. I, I had one this week, and I was like, man, it really does taste like a mocha. <laughs> a mocha that gets you drunk? I'm in. Uh, it's all in, all in. And it's, it's <laughs> no, it um, I don't great. know how widely they're going to distribute this one. Um, probably not as widely as the regular Merlin, but it's an excellent beer if you like um, oatmeal stouts. I like stouts. I do like oatmeal yeah, stouts. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I see, and I they're, see it's in a can, oh, so that's at least you'll be yeah. able to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look for the Mocha Merlin if you if you want to try another great Firestone Walker beer. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Yes. Well, speaking of awesome, well done, Mary Jo Foley. You held down the fort. Paul ran out the door. That's how well you did. I know. We didn't, <laughs> turned out we didn't need a gong. We didn't even need the gong at the end. That was good. Paul's <laughs> going back to work at therot.com, T-H-U-R-O-T-T.com. Uh, and you, you go back to work at allaboutmicrosoft.com on ZDNet. Hi. That's your blog. Uh, we do this show every Wednesday with Paul and Mary Jo around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. So please stop by. Will you both be back? You're going to, it was nice of you because you could have been at your apartment, but you decided to come over to. Yeah. Yeah. I said, let, him, let me keep him company. That was nice of you. <laughs> and thanks to yeah. the folks yeah, at we'll CUNY, too. Yeah, we'll both be back too. home. Yep. Both. Yeah. Thanks to CUNY. That was yeah. awesome that you yeah. guys let us come yeah. and read your classroom here <laughs> so is jeff jarvis there or is he he's probably no, he's, he's not home. here figures yep. he's at home <laughs> or yep. in germany <laughs> all right yep. well uh it was great talking to you uh, everybody should come back next week for paul and mary joe back in their respective uh, yep, abodes we be home. and uh you can catch this show uh on our website twit.tv slash ww if you want to download copies instead of listening live you can also uh, subscribe. You can even listen on your Echo. I bet you Cortana has a way of doing it. But on the Echo, you say, hey, Echo, uh, listen to Windows Weekly on TuneIn. TuneIn is kind of the key because that's the provider, TuneIn Internet Radio. Or you can say, hey, listen, hey, hey Echo, listen to uh, Twit Live on TuneIn. You'll hear the live stream. Either way, we hope you'll come back next week. We'd love to see you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye, Mary Jo. Bye-bye.